Sometimes I wonder if we take the idea of progress for granted. Do we assume that just because time is moving forward, humanity is moving forward? No, by and large, net net, I believe we are progressing. Technology enables individuals in magical ways. Economic freedom to the extent that it's been present has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. We are more interconnected than ever before, more prosperous than ever before. And yet, in certain areas, we do seem to be going backwards. Take India, for example. Our society seems to have become more more and more polarized and intolerant. Our politics is shrill and full of anger. Our languages, our amazing wealth of languages, are fading away, if not dying out. Our cities sometimes seem to be becoming unlivable. And to make sure that we keep progressing, we need to question all these fault lines. We need to watch the watchmen. We need to empower the better angels of our nature. The only way to ensure progress is to not take it for granted. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen. My guest today is Rakshinda Jalil, a writer, translator, critic, and literary historian. She wears many hats. I think of her as someone who preserves a fading world and chronicles a changing one. She's written an outstanding book on the history of the progressive writers' movement. She's translated many great Hindi and Urdu writers. She's been an essayist and columnist. She's written a book of short stories. And I particularly love her brilliant book of essays, But You Don't Look Like a Muslim. In this conversation, we chat about Urdu, the personal and the political, the art of translation, the changing face of Delhi, and the elephant in the room, the social polarization of these times. This conversation contains multitudes, and I hope you will enjoy it as much as I did. But before we get to it, let's take a quick commercial break. Hey, the music started and this sounds like a commercial, but it isn't. It's a plea from me to check out my latest labor of love, a YouTube show I am co-hosting with my good friend, the brilliant Ajay Shah. We've called it Everything is Everything. Every week, we'll speak for about an hour on things we care about, from the profound to the profane, from the exalted to the everyday. We range widely across subjects and we bring multiple frames with which we try to understand the world. Please join us on our journey and please support us by subscribing to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash amitvarma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. The show is called Everything is Everything. Please do check it out. Rakshinda, welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. Thank you. So I'm going to start with what might appear to be an unusual question. I've just come from Bombay. We are recording this on Jan 10th and there is this I- immense cold wave in, uh, the, at the, in the north. And I've, of course, come from Bombay to Delhi. And yesterday I stepped out of the airport and I felt that I have stepped into a windy freezer. It was mind-blowing. I have experienced north winters before I was born in Chandigarh, but this was like, oh my God. And later I got to thinking about, you know, how difficult it is even for a modern person with with all our modern privileges and all that to kind of survive in this winter. And it got me to thinking about how, uh, you know, in the past, people would have dealt with these kind of extremes of weather. And in a sense, it is, um, it's lucky that I'm speaking with you because you've also written among many, many other things on Delhi's past and all of that. And I'm really fascinated by Delhi in the sense that there have been many different cities overlapping over time, the same geographical space. And with every city, the way that you live changes. Like there is this famous saying about how first we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us. You know, the form of the city changes the way that we live. And equally, I guess, the weather does does that as well. So I'm, I'm wondering in a broader sense, not just in terms of adapting to the cold, but in a broader sense, when you've written these books and when you've, you know, gone back in the past, what is your sense of how people lived their lives 300, 400, 500 years ago? Like if, if you were born 500 years earlier, what would the texture of a typical day look like? No, that's very interesting. But I think uh, we... The people who lived in Delhi before us 300, 400 years, I can only imagine it or I can imagine it with the help of what I've read of uh, the literature of that time, mostly in Urdu. I would say people were more in tune with the seasons. And I think what's happened is that we lead our lives according to the way we want to live it, not how the weather expects us to live. So our homes um, and most of Delhi now is this uh, builder built flats. 
they are all cut from the same template there are cookie cutter homes that we live in most of us uh, they're designed to be pretty and pretty again is is a subjective thing so i don't think these houses that most of us now live in in delhi flats let's call them are meant to uh, accommodate the seasons and the whims of the seasons i think uh, summers are still okay because you know we we hunker down in our coolers in our acs and uh, wait for the worst summer days to pass but i don't think these houses are meant uh they have no sense of catching the sun there is no angan there is no concept of sitting out in the sun so the delhi i grew up in and we need not go back 300 400 years in time i'm willing to go back to the delhi i grew up in as a young person uh, i lived in nizamuddin east there were lots of parks most homes had a little sit out or a, you know angan or call it what you will um the idea of spending as much time as you could out in the sun during winter was uh, very prevalent you'll notice that there's a lot of vitamin d deficiency now doctors are routinely prescribing vitamin d supplements which is ironic in a country which has so much sun ordinarily through the year we as a people are suffering from vitamin d deficiencies and we are having to take supplements I think it's all to do with our lifestyles with our homes with the way we spend our time we spend fewer hours out in the sun and I think the generations before ours had an intrinsic sense an organic wisdom I would say you know about how to what to eat um kis cheez ki kya taaseer hai khane ki peene ki um the things around you kis cheez ki kya taaseer hai taaseer meaning what is the what is the benefit of a certain food or a certain drink and how it would help your body be it immunity be it um, just nutrition so i think somewhere we have lost touch with what was plentifully available and uh, we buy from cold chains we buy out of season green peas in summer and fruits that are come in in uh, in iced containers from japan and china my fruit seller was tell, trying to sell me big fat chilies from uh, cherries from uh, uh, brazil and chili now i don't see the need for that i'm perfectly happy eating apples that have come from kulu you know so i think our ancestors a didn't have these amenities of freights and cold storages but more importantly i think they ate local they ate seasonal all of this and the kind of houses they lived in i think all of this made it that much better to cope with the vagaries of the weather and the seasons There's a great essay I'll link from the show notes by Alex Murrell called The Age of Average where he talks about how in almost every area of life things begin to look the same over a period of time and what you said about buildings falls into exactly that and he has got these beautiful montages of buildings from all over the world and they look exactly the same but you know 300 years ago they would have looked different it's the same with cars for example all SUVs basically go into the same wind tunnels and come out looking exactly the same way and so on and so forth and I I was beginning to wonder there about the nature of how the form of living shapes our culture and like you said you know back in the day you know you attuned to the weather to the way it was you ate accordingly you ate according to what was available and you know even houses were designed that way there's a great book called order without design by Alain Berthaud where uh, you know uh, he, he was an economist and urban planner an urban planner and economist rather in that order and he was in Algeria which was uh, sort of under french influence at the time and he speaks about how he was out there that he had this problem that he had to as part of the bureaucracy he had to uh, sort of enforce these regulations which told you how a house should be built and how it should look and he realized that there is a problem there because the french government is imposing its vision of what a french townhouse in a french city should look like 
in an Algerian town and his description of their way of life seemed very similar to me to how a lot of India, particularly North India, has lived where you will have a joint large family, you will have an open courtyard in the centre, everything within the house will look inwards towards that open courtyard where there will be a communal gathering in the evenings and there is not much interface with the outside, you know. And his point was that you cannot build in a different way from what the culture is like because you risk a clash happening. But a point that you have also made in co columns of yours which are linked from the show notes, I think you wrote this for The Wire, is about how you know, so much of Delhi's beautiful architecture is just being taken over by these cookie cutter apartment buildings. And while urbanization and all that is great, one kind of needs to think about it. And and the, the question that you sort of seem to pose there is like, what are we losing in all of this? So w w what are sort of your uh, thoughts on that seeing the city evolve over the time that you've been here? I came to live in Delhi when I was about three years old from a small town called Aligarh nearby. So my entire schooling and uh, most of my growing up has happened in this city. In the process, I've also seen it change over the years. In the 60s, when I came to live here and uh, we lived in Nizamuddin East, we had vestiges of a Nehruvian India. Nehru was, of course, gone by then. But uh, by 67, when I first came here, we had a city that was was uh, learning to cope with a lot of uh, dignity and, uh, 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 you know, with a lot of grace, with the changes of uh, partition. We had people, um, uh, many in the, the neighborhood I grew up in, we use the word colony in Delhi, it's an awful word, but that's what we say here. So uh, Nizamuddin East was a, a refugee colony. Most of the people who'd come had come from out there, as they say. And they had stories of their homes, of of the the angans they would left behind, and the you know the kind of life they had. But that Delhi, the houses that were given to these um, migrants, uh, refugees, uh, uh, call it what you will, survivors of the partition, were uh, issued by the government. But changes were made as time passed. Today, uh, what you are referring to uh, is um, is is a is a city or a government council telling people what their houses should be like and imposing a certain uniformity, which to some extent possibly makes sense. Unfortunately, we are living in a time where our houses and our design aesthetic is uh, decided not by the government, not even by us ourselves but by a bunch of people who are builders, actually. So their aesthetic, their idea of what a house should look like is a mishmash of something out of an American sitcom and something out of their idea of... Uh, you see the high-rises also, you know. You can mistake yourself for being in Singapore or anywhere in the world. There is a, uh, there's a kind of... Um, I don't know, a cosmopolitan, global, homogeneous, cut from the same look. And it's not just the how rises, it's even the, the builder built apartment buildings in, in uh, uh, neighborhoods in Delhi. Um, they also have a certain sameness. Um, the aesthetic is not yours or mine or individual at all. It is a builder's aesthetic. So the use of glass, of steel, none of which are very conducive for our environment, for our weather. The use of marble, um, you know, the 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 use of things which have uh, which don't even have lasting value by the way because the builder who's build selling you the flat is not interested in its in the life you know he'll be perfectly happy if you knock it down and build it again so we're not even talking of longevity here we are talking of a kind of again i will use a word with a lot of caution aesthetics it need not be our aesthetic it, it'll be just an aesthetic that has been foisted on us now um here, I just want to mention um, the work I've been doing over Delhi's built uh, heritage. The, you know, the forces of urban renewal tell us that the past has its place, but it has its place in a limited sense. And people interpret it differently. Cities as old as ours, like, uh, like Istanbul or Rome, have dealt with urban renewal and dealt with it in different ways. Ours, I'm afraid, has not been so, let's say, it doesn't compare so well. We are, the Delhi we live in is supposed to be the 
10th, some say 11th city built either one on top of each other or contiguous to each other, often cannibalizing one city in order to build another. Many years ago, by Times of India, I was asked to write a column. I called it Invisible City. I wrote it as a weekly column, then it shifted to another magazine called Invisible, uh, called First City, where again, bearing the same name, Invisible City, it became a monthly column. And eventually, I put them as a book. It continues to sell very well today. The book is called Invisible City. And it's all about the lesser known monuments of Delhi. So <clears throat> all those years, I would go and uh, research a monument. I would go look at a monument, talk to the people living in its neighborhood and write it. I'm not a historian by training. My training is literary history. So history is something I read. It came from a position of, of great love for the city where I came as a very young person, where I grew up. And I was concerned as to why we have this disregard for the past and why we think that history is not a continuum, not a river, but something from which we can pick and choose. So we can throw away this and say, oh, this part doesn't make sense to me. So let's do away with this. This part I'm willing to keep because it makes sense to my larger narrative. Many things came together, I felt, in our understanding of history in a city like Delhi. There were the inconvenient bits and pieces that were jutting into people's homes, so it seemed okay to just lop off a dome here, a wall there, and extend your own terrace. I can give you an example on Haley Road, where the Agrasen Ki Bauli is, which is a beautifully preserved water step well. There used to be, I have seen it with my own eyes, a kind of next to the Bavli, a kind of, a, um, you can call it, a, it, it had three domes and it was possibly a rest house, sarai, inn for travelers next to a Bavli. I remember the three domes. Over the years that I would go to research this, one dome was lopped off. Then another dome was knocked off. Why? Because the person living next door wanted to put his dish antenna and this dome was rather inconvenient. And this is in Haley Road in the heart of central Delhi. So this sort of thing, even though we have rules in place, the ASI has rules saying that you cannot build anything, you cannot renovate, you cannot even do your home constructions, renovations without taking proper permission from the relevant authorities if there is a protected monument in your neighborhood. But there is blatant disregard for those rules. There is a flouting of all possible safeguards that are there. I mean, uh, uh, legally we are fine. Legally we've got all the safeguards. It's the flouting of the rules that is where the problem lies. And in all those years when I was researching and writing those columns, I always found that things that I had gone to see I'm a Chashmdeed Gaba. I'm an eyewitness. I have seen Bavlis. I have seen tombs. I have seen Sarais with my own eyes in my own lifespan. And here we don't even need to go into history books. We don't even need to go into uh, Asaru Sanadid, which is this wonderful book written by Sir Sayyid Ahmed. Sir Sayyid Ahmed, we know as the founder of the Aligarh Muslim University, but he was a Delhi Wala and a proud Delhi Wala. And um, he has written this wonderful book called Asaru Sanadid, which means Remains of the Past, which contains beautiful, immaculate documentation of the many monuments, So, uh, which was written in about uh, the mid-19th century. So from 150 years ago to now, I don't need to compare. Of course, many, many of those things are gone. I'm talking about my own life span. I'm 60 years old and I began doing this work in my 30s. So in 30 years, I've seen an enormous change. There is greed, there is capriciousness, there is plain and simple blithe disregard, the menuki culture that we call in Delhi. Hmm? And the reverse is tenuki, like how does it matter to me and why should it matter to you? So this menuki and tenuki culture lies at the heart of what we are seeing in Delhi um, of uh, of uh, while we are still talking of we are not coming into culture we are not coming into behavior we are still talking of built heritage and here I see greed compounded by this disregard by this how does it matter oh there were some kings who ruled for five years how does it matter you know so Shapur Jat you know you don't know 
why, what, when. I used to go and talk to the people who lived there. I would ask the guard of some house, ke aapko pata hai ye kya jaga thi? And they would say, Raja Rani ka mehel tha. Now, this is not a mehel. There was no Raja Rani. So, even architecturally, we can't be bothered to find out the exact name, the exact purpose of that building, why it was built. Ye to chodiye ke when it was built or by whom it was built. But we often don't even know who lies buried there or what purpose did the building serve. Which is why I call my column and then later the book Invisible City. So all of these many cities that are in modern Delhi are for many of us invisible because we might take our dog for a walk through their grounds. We might take a shortcut. We might drive past them on our way to work. But we couldn't really be bothered to find out even the real name of that structure. And in South Delhi, where we are recording today, there is an embarrassment of riches. There are so many monuments, some listed, some not listed, some protected, some not protected. Even the ones that are protected, the ASI, the Archaeological Survey of India, thinks that it's okay to just build a fence and throw away the key, you know. Now, history is not a caged beast. It's not something that you have to view through the bars of a fence. I think we will be invested in our past if we are able to see it, be a part of it. So I don't subscribe to this way of government agencies building fences, throwing away keys, and then you just see it as a, as a, I don't know, Artifact. Artifact. Uh, just a lurking beast in our mist. And if it's pretty and, and again I use the word pretty in a in a in a with 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 inverted commas and uh, emphasis. Uh if it's pretty then it's just a postcard like background to our lives. In South Delhi, we see it everywhere. There is a scenic looking tomb that you can see from your balcony and it just adds value. It just adds to the property price of your flat. I don't think that's the purpose of history. If only these places were accessible, some of them are now in the 30 years that I've been writing about them. I have seen, let's be, let's not diss everything. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think there is a change happening in some ways. There is There are heritage walks, uh, concerned citizens groups, RWAs. They're trying to do their bit. I'm seeing some light at the end of this tunnel, but I wish there was more. I wish the government agencies had a different view of history, of built heritage. Uh, concerned citizens groups, for example, let me give you an example. Three effigies of Ravan and his brothers were burnt right bang in the middle of a cluster of tombs in Arkepuram. The RWA went to court and said, and in, given the charged religious mahal that we have in our times, I think it took a lot of courage and foresight and vision of this concerned citizens group to go to court and say, let's by all means burn the effigies, but let's please not burn them right here where the noise and the smoke will do damage to these protected uh, monuments. So every now and then something like this happens. Every now and then an RWA says, let's do in these large sprawling grounds of a monument, let's have rainwater harvesting systems in place. You know, so every now and then it really pleases my heart to see uh, some sort of citizens initiative. It's still coming from citizens groups. I'd be that much happier if this spills over into civil society and to, and there is more, you know, government, private, public partnerships happening. I think the Aga Khan Trust for Culture and the amazing work they've done here under the helmsmanship of Ratish Nanda, the conservation architect, he has shown us the way towards public-private partnerships. I think a city like Delhi, we can't just expect government agencies to do everything. Why? Because we, there's so much. 
It's not one or two or three. We have an embarrassment of riches. There is so much here. So we can't always really expect the government to do everything, nor other government agencies, be it the ASI, the MCD. I think civil society needs to step in. I think more public-private partnerships are the way forward for a city like Delhi, with so much happening. I'm not saying start having fashion shows in Lodi Garden. I'm not saying that. People have tried to do that. It's a fine line. It's a balance, you know, and that fine line has to be found by citizens themselves. I share your lament about what's happening to the city and as you yourself have pointed out, you know, there are other great cities which we visit as tourists like Istanbul and Rome, which have a completely different approach and you get a sense of the city of the past coexisting with the city of the present. I have a broader question here which i'm i'm thinking aloud so i might be kind of incoherent but the broader question is that what is a city right like i have lived in bombay since the mid 1990s and i love the city but i cannot say that i really know the city i know a particular sliver of the city which is the sliver that has surrounded me and that i carry with me and that has actually developed with me i don't really have a deep historical sense of it and yet i think i have as much claim over the city as anyone else who kind of lives there and as you've pointed out but uh, uh, you know more than 90% of people in delhi are probably migrants perhaps even more depending on how far back you go and they are coming from different places and their imperatives are possibly different and even the 10% who are here may not have that deep sense of history of knowing oh i'm in shahpur jhat and this is what this place was and a city is clearly not its buildings alone because that would make it completely dead equally a city in an immediate moment might seem to be its people but it is also actually a lot more than that i had an episode ages back with rana safi where she spoke eloquently about all the many different of cities that you know whose ghosts kind of are superimposed on each other as we are so how should we think of a city because on one level you could say that hey the 90% of people who are migrants here they just want to give a live a good life they are happy with a cookie cutter apartment because a cookie cutter apartment is obviously it makes sense economically for builders to just put them up and they're kind of happy with that and they're getting on with their lives and i wonder and again i'm thinking aloud uh, that do citizens start caring about their cities and the history in the past after they reach a certain sort of level of prosperity or whatever because otherwise if you're living um, amid the everyday sort of scarcities that one lives through in these cities it tenuki menuki does become a natural way to think about the world but you know how have uh, how have the istanbuls and roms evolved for that reason like i went to athens a few months ago and i was actually really disappointed because everything that was there from the past whether it's a parthenon or whatever uh, seemed to me to be like you know put in a showcase for tourists and they weren't really living in that sense and i also wonder about if we speak, speak of an historic spot like lodi gardens when it first came up was something then it became something else uh, today if you have jazz concerts there it'll be one thing or if you just have other things happening there it'll be another thing what is a place really and can cities really survive how does one think about them i think a city is a sum of its parts you know it's not any one thing it can't just be people it can't certainly can't be just monuments roads parks trees it can't be those but it can be the sum of its parts my delhi will be very different from somebody living in silampur so you know there is all of that but the example that uh, we like to give of other ancient cities such as rome and istanbul to name just two is in some ways not fair to delhi because delhi has had this great a great uh, tragedy that these two cities have not had which is the partition of 47 and the outflow of population of those who lived here and the inflow of another set of uh, population so that changed the the demographics or and the dynamics of this city it's not just the refugees who came post 47 it's not just the people from shah janabad who left remember this is also different from other cities because it's the capital of india so people came and not just uh, from now 1911 from the time of the darbar onwards this was the colonial seat of administration so 
even in british times there were a whole bunch of people from other parts of the country living and working here because they worked for the colonial administration in fact all of lutians delhi was built to accommodate the, all those houses in lutians delhi where our uh, bureaucrats and judges and others live was actually built to accommodate the colonial officers so and not just them there were also flats and other things built for the those who were smaller cogs in that larger machinery which was the clerks the typists this and that and then when a uh, uh, post 47 again i mean with all of those shastri bhavan and this bhavan and that krishi bhavan and all that 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 was there in central delhi which is where the central government really ran so um, people came from different parts of the country to work for the central government so it was not just the refugees who came from pakistan to live here uh, to to for whom these new uh, uh, colonies lajpat nagar and amar colony and uh, or punjabi bag and or nizamuddin east all of these were built but remember also that housing had to be made for all of these uh, uh, government employees and they came in very very large numbers and they came from different parts of the country uh, in the 60s uh, the delhi that i grew up in when you ask somebody where are you from they would name their village in bihar or tamil nadu or wherever and they said we are our families from there today when you say where are you from uh, uh, they invariably say def call or wherever you know so the roots have gone in you are very right in saying that the sense of engagement with the city comes from the years that you've lived the istanbulus and the romas are different from us because they and their ancestors have been living there of course there must be people coming from other cities too to live in these two big cities like istanbul and rome but i think there must definitely be a large population of people who've been living there for a very long time in delhi that is not the case but in these 30 40 50 years i think i see the change in people and that is reflected in very many ways these heritage groups that we are talking about i remember going for them uh, i remember conducting some myself uh, many years ago there would be smaller groups a small stray bunch of people sometimes some foreigners expatriates who would go for these now i see very large groups uh, i don't run these groups myself anymore these heritage walks but i know people who are doing them and i know that the turnout is very good uh, people pay money to come for these um, and there are many many players so all of this gives me a sense that the sense of engagement with the city has deepened which is very good because till there is a sense of engagement there will not be this sense of investing in the city and i'm not talking of philanthropy i'm not talking of uh, putting your money where your mouth is i'm only talking of an emotional intellectual involvement i see that happening now because people are willing to um you know um many things that have come to the courts such as for example do not burn uh, do not cut trees do not burn your uh, uh, your refuse in open fires because all of that adds to pollution many of these things were taken up by the courts so motto on their own but many things were brought to the notice of the courts by concerned citizens groups i am seeing all of these things in a cumulative manner i am seeing all of these things towards a larger good whether it's the courts in delhi and the courts in delhi are quite quite proactive whether it is the judiciary whether it is the people's groups whether it is rwas i think they are coming together and they are seeing the larger good of the doing away of uh, uh, diesel run buses about 10 years ago by the previous uh, sheila dikshit government i think that was a very visionary step for this city to make the investment in in cng run buses all of this will have a cumulative effect in the years to come so i think we are looking at a delhi where the sense of engagement where the sense of involvement is increasing there will be a trickle down effect i hope maybe not in my lifetime but certainly in the years ahead 
when you talk about you know something that binds a city together that it's more than its people or more than its monuments i guess the nebulous word culture the culture of a yeah. city could be yeah. you know used and this yeah. reminds me of this beautiful passage i want to read out from uh, you know but you don't like a muslim hmm. which is you know which i got reminded of in this afternoon i'm staying with a interrupt you just for a second sure. because an image has popped into my head and please. i just want to share it and please do read the passage yeah, later yeah, please, go ahead. you were talking about living in bombay and so on um now there is a citizens group in bombay for history buffs they did a walk basuda's bombay oh, okay. you know so the films that he shot in bombay so your city is what you make of it for this group of people you know it that mosmi chatterji and amitabh bachchan song somebody recreated that mm. all those places on a monsoon day in bombay where that that song was shot so this group of heritage buffs retraced and went to all the places where basuda shot his films and some of the most iconic shots so a city is what you make of it it can be anything now um, those that's mostly central bombay south bombay whatever you know town as it's called and that's not all that is there is andheri there is uh, the outskirts i mean there is n- n- navi mumbai now so i think to come back to delhi what we make of it it could be a sliver so there can't be a definitive delhi you know i mean you have uh, ad campaigns run by the government of delhi meri jaan and all that which is all very good but i think everybody will have and this is true for all big cities new york and so on everybody will have their hood their bit of the neighborhood that they think is theirs and they they very proud of that so I don't know if it's possible to have a monochromatic view of uh, large cities. Sorry I interrupted you. Please uh, no, you no, please. you were you were reading something. Please so. feel entirely free to interrupt me when such uh, delightful images pop into your head. This just popped into my head and I uh, do look up uh, look out for this there's a there's a recreation of this Basuda song. It's beautiful. I absolutely want to uh, you know go on that and people don't mix either songs like that or films like that these yeah. days which is a different matter. What you're describing also tells you how cities contain multitudes yeah. and equally one of the forces that you've lamented of affecting culture is the force of homogenization and i was reminded of this uh, today when i'm uh, you know during this trip to delhi i'm staying with a friend uh, called kumar and he said i'll make you the best dal in the world and i was like okay i'm like a strict non vegetarian but fine make me your dal i will try it and he made the dal and it really was very good and uh, then i asked him what tarka have you used and i want to read out this great passage you wrote on sure. baghars or tarkas where you sure. wrote quote there was a time one that even i remember from my hori childhood when each dish had its own distinctive baghar the arhar ki dal for example loved by the crew connoisseurs including mirza galib as confessed in his letters had a baghar of one sukhi lal mirch a whole red chili and roughly chopped cloves of garlic giving it a wonderfully roasted nutty flavor the masoor ki dal would have browned onions the urad always white and not yellowed with turmeric as it comes now would arrive smothered under a melange of crispy brown onion juliennes of ginger finely chopped green chilies and fresh green coriander and the faintest smidgen of hing asafoetida popped in hot oil to reduce the dal's body gas inducing qualities stop quote and apologies to everyone listening for my pronunciations they are uniformly bad across mm-hmm. uh, languages and i also want to sort of talk about this sense of homogenization a bit like you've described it in terms of food like you've spoken about the invasion of the tomato how there is paneer and everything and how you are horrified that you know we are now reaching the time when no one will remember growing up without the existence of paneer you've described the distinction between roti and fulka and how the beautiful roti is lost to the uh, you know to the sad imposter the fulka in modern times so on one hand there is there are these multitudes we all contain and which are there in our culture and which are so delightful and on the other hand you do have these homogenizing influences which come at us in the context of food pushpesh pant ji was on my show a while back and he was really angry about you know what is happen the food they serve at weddings which is the same north indian nonsense all over the place so they might have a chowmin counter uh and the other aspect of this is that technology also enables people to sort of keep their little niches and grooves alive you know in in uh, d- different ways i've had an episode with vinay singhal who has a uh, runs a platform called stage.in which is which has content in 
Haryanvi, Bhojpuri, you know, the dialects and not the major uh, quote-unquote languages. Uh, and his argument is that it can go the other way, that everything doesn't have to get homogenized into something that is bland and dull and so on. And uh, you've got a beautiful section, your part two of your book, uh, But You Don't like, Look Like a Muslim, is entirely on culture. I love the memories and that. And you've written about food and music and so many other things. Uh, what is your sense of this through all of these years, having kind of engaged deeply with all this? You know, globalization is all very good and, 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 and useful and important and you can't uh, be an ostrich and stick your head in the sand and say, I'm, I'm, I don't want to look at the world around me. You can't do that. You can't get away from the world, uh, uh, really. In culinary terms, uh, let's first talk of food, then we'll come to culture in a broader sense. In food, you know, Fusion can work sometimes, but there is great deal to be said for the nani dadi ki recipes. Uh, I'm not saying that you throw away your mixer grinder and install a mortar and pestle. Well, have one as a standby for days when you win want that authentic look. Why authentic? Because the uh, mortar and pestle or the silbatta crushed the surface and did not uh, puree it, you see. So the texture was different. And scientists also tell us that garlic should be crushed for its flavors to be released. There was a great deal of native wisdom in the pantries and the kitchens and uh, the way it was done in a Nani Dadi's kitchens. So Native wisdom is one thing. The other thing is that, you know, uh, there was something to be said for the way uh, a, a dish is conjured. There is a science to it, you know. There is a there is a logic to it. Uh, and this, just because tomatoes, for example, are plentifully available, they weren't in my growing up years, by the way. We had desi tomato, which came at a certain time. The green revolution that was taking place in the Punjab and the the creation of food chains and other things made food available throughout the year. The tomatoes we get are not the desi tomatoes anymore. They are a hybrid variety of the Roma tomatoes. Uh, these were unheard of. Nobody had it. And also tomato, tomato as it was called, was either put in designated dishes like tomato gosht, for example, or it would be chopped up and used in a salad. Today, we use the tomato to thicken curries, to add color to something that doesn't need color. We use it just like that because we like to see the pale bits of reds floating around in our dals, which never initially had them. So, I'm saying that sometimes the fidelity to a recipe is important. If a recipe did not require, let's talk of dal, plain simple dal that we all have, does not really need an arhar ki dal, benefits in no particular way with the addition of tomatoes. Why are we doing it? Just because we like to see that pop of color, which is not adding flavor, which is not adding texture, which is not doing anything. So the homogenization is happening not just because these things are available, but because of the People who are cooking for us, uh, in the essay that you have just read, uh, referred to, it's the people who are cooking for us in big cities. We have help maids, again, not a very politically correct word, but the, our domestic helpers are people uh, from distant towns and states where they don't eat these things themselves. The food that they eat is very different from the food that they're required to cook in the homes of the people they work for. So, uh, there is no native wisdom there. There is no native way of doing things. They are learning things, which is why they are adding things that are neither native to them nor to the people they are cooking for. I don't see this as an example of fusion. I see this as an example of just things going awry, you know. I think uh, that is also one of the reasons that uh, which... In the process, I think what will happen, and I can understand the fury of a food purist like Pushpesh Pantji, whom I respect very much, and I can I can fully share his frustration and anger at the homogenization that we are having, not just in our everyday food, but in the in our in our banquets, in our weddings, and so on. I personally see no reason on earth why we must be serving Italian and Chinese and so on. The array of food, the sheer wastage of food, the sheer mindless display of wealth that we see on such occasions in the, um, a great deal of it is wasted. I perf 
personally would be perfectly happy having one cuisine of course with vegetarian non vegetarian options but not this ridiculous mindless variety my driver has just come back from uh, he lives in a village in, in the avad region in somewhere near faizabad and he got his daughter married and he said he had chinese he had uh, pasta he had apart from the gosh then everything that is made in a up wedding and i was asking him why he says agar hum nahi karenge to log sochenge hum kanjusi kar rahe hain so if this is happening in small rural india this notion of kanjusi this notion of showing that you have arrived this notion of showing your wealth through food through buffets through banquets i think somewhere this has to stop you know we shouldn't have to wait for a war my mother tells me that in, during the war with china uh, there was a ban on banquets um, you know big fancy weddings during the war uh, with china uh, shastri ji gave the jai jawan jai kisan slogan and many families forego uh, chose to forego one meal like they would skip a lunch they would skip a dinner because food was being rationed there were food shortages I don't think we as a nation as a society should wait for god forbid god forbid an act of of war or terrorism or a calamity to happen why can't we be a little more mindful of the wastage that we have as a society I'm sorry I'm sounding very I'm showing my age and sounding like a, a very old person talking like this no, but no I think any sensible young person would agree like 100% with what you're saying the wastage of electricity lights come on at diwali time and they run all up till new year you know so for a good two and a half months you have a very conspicuous consumption of uh, wealth of what is called in delhi showing off i'm not sure what purpose if it brings you good cheer yes but two and a half months is excessive so i think as a society as a people we are richer as a nation we've moved away from the war time shortages of uh, 60s we've certainly moved away from the post 47 india where we there was rationing and you know all kinds of shortages uh, we are no longer a closed economy we've had our you know globalization and our opening up of the economy all that is all very good but this display this um wastage this um i mean this money can be put to better use i think i think my real objection is like if you really really want to have a lot of pasta have a lot of pasta but my real objection to all of this as you pointed out is that it is like signaling like your driver said that i have to signal to the people around me that mere bhi kuch you know hasiyat okay, hai okay, okay, okay. hai and uh, uh, and and that's what kind of makes me sad because i i think that is really new money playing out you know old money in a sense would be content to just be what it is and it it, it speaks to perhaps you know you might be wealthy but there is a poverty of the soul here if you feel the need to signal anything at all i mean i wish people were like more menu ki tenu ki in this regard yeah. you know and so saying that's that that's one place there should be that's one place say sort of should be and you were going to go beyond uh, food and talk about culture as well that this aspect of homogenization yeah culture again you know it takes a yash chopra film to remind us of the beauty of indian culture of whether it is uh, uh, kadwa chauth or whatever so uh, i don't think this uh, we, we need to go beyond the scenic quality of these rituals uh, you know culture uh, for me is um, a lot of uh, the things that we grew up with that are part of, that are reflected in our dress in our clothes in our food in what we eat how we conduct ourselves and what i refer to very early on in this conversation the seasonality you know of being in tune with seasons in tune with climate um of of uh, the horis and the kajris that were sung um not necessarily the same sort of music even music even the perfumes the itar that was used would be according to the season it would be khas it would be something depending on the time of the year so i think uh, this should not be we should not be in such a hurry to throw it all out we should not be in such a hurry to diss it and homogenize everything so i'm using the word culture in a very broad sense like i said what you eat what you wear what you even how you think 
your your rituals your uh, how a uh, what a baby is fed at 4 months at 6 months you know there are these rituals in different parts of the country known by different names but essentially coming from the same place the first anna the first cereal that goes into a baby's mouth it could be rice in somewhere it could be milk and banana somewhere else it would depend on which part of the country it is but there's a ritual and there's a little ceremony that accompanies that ritual so whether it is rituals for life for death for mourning for coping with grief i think there is a lot to be said for those rituals so again i'm using the word culture in its broadest possible sense to encompass all of life and what we are now doing is we have a a, a remembrance meeting we hire a, at the time of a death we hire a, a hall and we are i think just aping the west in very many ways it's all about making speeches about uh, i don't remember the uh, death uh, ceremonies that we used to have in our different cultures in our different regions being necessarily about making speeches you know it was not how you felt but it was about how you shared your grief so the family came together you ate together a neighbor or a family cooked the first meal after somebody had departed so that chulha nahi chalega you know somebody would cook and send food for you you would all sit together and eat i think there was a lot of camaraderie uh, there was a lot of good sense also behind it that uh, you don't need to be alone when you've had a bereavement you need to be with friends and family so if somebody cooks and brings food and sits with you and eats that food they are also giving you company you're not all by yourself so all of these rituals which are time honored they had a lot of good sense behind them somewhere in a hurry to just imitate western cultures we are doing away with a lot that was good in our own culture and what we are replacing it with when we talk of indian culture is a kind of hyper nationalism very jingoistic nationalism we talk of bhartiya sanskriti but we talk about it from one lens and we talk about it i'm sorry to say from a very saffron lens and from a very political lens instead i think we need to have a more humane attitude towards culture bhartiya sabhyata bhartiya sanskriti is not the monopoly of any one set of people i think it belongs to all people who live in this country who are from here even the diaspora for that matter has every right to claim bhartiya sanskriti just because they may not be living in india as of now but their ancestors their purvaj did and maybe they have carried the seeds of that sanskriti and sabhyata with them so i for one don't feel that the nris and the larger indian diaspora community cannot lay claim to it of course they have as much claim to it as those of us who live within the physical boundaries and borders of this country but it must be borne in mind that culture is not monochromatic culture is not cut from the one cloth culture is not what any party or power decides to tell us is culture i think the culture will vary widely between assam and kerala between rajasthan and kashmir so one culture does not have legitimacy and the other culture has no legitimacy that will not i don't think that is is right and fair neither does one culture have supremacy over another culture uh you cannot say that uh, the culture of this state it could be gujarat it could be kashmir it could be bengal is representative of indian culture i think it's the coming together of the parts the mistake some of us are making today in india is that we are allowing to be led uh by a very jingoistic hypernationalistic very chauvinistic culture well said and you know of all the possible homogenizations happening around us there is only one i worry deeply about and that is in our politics that's exactly the the saffronization that you speak of and we'll come back to that but before we you know get there a couple of other things i wanted to double click on and one is also sort of 
द चेंजिंग नेचर ऑफ फैमिली विद इन आर सोसाइटी बिकॉज अ लॉट ऑफ कल्चर कम्स फ्राम देर दिस यू हैव दिस डिलाइटफुल पैराग्राफ इन योर बुक मेमरीज ऑफ समर्स पास्ट वे यू स्पीक ऑफ योर यू नो योर ग्रैंड मदर्स होम एट वन शिबली रोड अलीगढ़ एंड यू जस्ट डिस्क्राइब इट सो ब्यूटिफुली डेट आई विल नॉट इवन कोट फ्रॉम इट आई जस्ट आस्क ऑल माई रीडर्स टू गो एंड चेक इट आउट लवली पीस ऑफ राइटिंग एंड देर it is like the entire extended family is kind of together the elders have the kids around them uh, you know that native wisdom passes on and becomes native in an, another generation so on and so forth and i think in a sense the journey of a society has been one from those kind of families to nuclear families and then to even worse atomized nuclear families where you will have uh, you know two parents and their kids sitting together for dinner but they all looking into their phone they're not even really together in a sense so what is your sense of the evolution of this because you have both been that little child you know 55 years ago surrounded by everyone in your family and i say 55 because i'm imagining you as a 5 year old surrounded yeah. by all of those people and you have also been a mother what what's what's your sense of how all this has changed and of course there are trade offs there are some things about it which are good which are great families can be deeply toxic but families can also keep you rooted in a certain way what's your sense yeah. of this so born in 1963 i'm 60 years old today uh, and i think i'm very blessed because i belong to that bridge generation uh, india was already a free country india was well on its path to uh, kind of finding its feet in the committee of nations india was um, uh, already a force to reckon with uh, in in the larger sense we had education we had good schools and colleges nehru had very grandly called them the temples of modern india in one of his speeches he'd said let the temples of modern india be the schools the colleges the dams the factories so that was the india i grew up in but at a purely family level i was also fortunate enough to uh, see an older way of life uh, which was still functional in my childhood the idea of going to grandparents homes spending the two months of the summer vacations with them going there for winter vacations living in in uh, and going to smaller cities in my case to aligarh which is where my nani and nana lived so knowing life uh, in a smaller city and then comparing it with life in a in a big city like delhi like i said i was this bridge i i saw that other world which was still there which was still intact i also saw it as it were pass away i saw my own parents hard working middle class you know the the, the truly the people who've built this india that we are today reaping uh, the fruits of the hard work of this generation my parents generation my father was a doctor my mother was a librarian in our school so like good solid middle class values that were given to us about jitni chadar ho utne pair phailao you know a switch off lights because somebody in a village doesn't have lights switch off the tap when you're brushing your teeth because some woman in a village is walking miles to fetch water and don't take all that you have for granted i remember narsimha rao's government coming i remember the opening up of the economy i grew up in a uh, delhi where there was just the ambassador and the fiat car i remember the maruti when it came and of course now there's no shortage of the number of cars you have here but so i remember that time when you would go to a super bazaar which was a government run outlet where you had a choice of two or three shampoos and three or four soaps Uh, all made in india all made by uh, indian brands i remember that time and i remember the opening up and the sudden coming in of foreign brands if you needed jeans in my growing up years you went to fuse which was a local brand or you relied on a on a kind uncle to bring you a, a wrangler or a levis from abroad so i am that generation my children uh, 25 and 27 uh, today have had enormous benefits not just in terms of greater uh, affluence but also technology um, more amenities so i have had the benefit of uh, my seeing my grandparents generation my father's generation my own generation and now i'm seeing my uh, two children grow up into young adults and their values um 
uh, change is inevitable i mean i um, can't say that everything was good in my growing up years and everything is necessarily bad now no it can't be it that's not humanly possible but i think if we carry bits and pieces of our past with us as we move to the future i think we will do well for ourselves as a people as a nation as a society as a country there was so much that was good in our past one of them and i'm sorry in the course of this conversation i'll keep coming back to the elephant in the room which is communalism and secularism so the one thing that was very good in my youth and early and childhood was the idea of living together separately which is how i describe it people had their food uh, fetishes like uh, i had a neighbor who didn't eat in our house but she didn't make us feel small for it she didn't eat in a house because she didn't eat in a kitchen where non veg was made which is perfectly fine if you gave her an apple or something uh, bhabhi ji we called her she was a older person but uh, uh, that's how everybody all the children in the neighborhood called her so bhabhi ji wouldn't eat cooked food but she would be perfectly happy to eat a banana or an apple or something or dry fruits and nobody minded it it did not come from a place of you are inferior therefore i will not have your food it was just that i don't eat in a place where non veg is made which is a perfectly fine thing i'm seeing a change now i'm seeing less tolerance i'm seeing greater othering nobody othered the other there were there were differences why will not there not be differences of course there are always differences and there will always be in a country as big as diverse as plural as ours there'll be uh, uh, differences of culture of language of food of clothes of everything we are a melting pot and especially big cities where there there's population from all parts of the country of course those differences will be there but what saddens me is that now we are allowing ourselves to focus on the differences this living together separately which was a lived uh, mantra in in my growing up years uh and even before um, i'm told that in gaon dehat log uh, you know they would not hukka to pee lenge lekin khayenge nahi ek dusre ke ghar ladki nahi bhayenge you will not have marriages in each other's homes which is fine but as long as you don't have the animus as long as you don't have the ill will as long as you don't have that hatred the toxicity that troubles me you know um I always salute the Sikh community. If one community has suffered most from the partition, it is the Sikhs. Um, there's been a displacement of population, loss of livelihood, homes. All of Punjab was this bloodied corridor through which people went from here to there and came from there to here. And yet. when i look at the six around me i see them as the most humane people in in this country and we as a people have so much to learn from them they are the first to stand up and offer help we saw that at the time of corona the six had organized themselves so well they were offering aid medicines when the big mosque in delhi jama masjid had to open at the end of covid at the end of the lockdown when it had to open for prayers the muslims were scared of going in there and cleaning the mosque it was the sikhs of delhi who went in who cleaned the mosque and allowed the friday prayer to happen i think we as a people need to have these shining beacons in our midst i need to learn lessons from them of the spirit of community of the spirit of brotherhood of helping here's one set of people who have every reason to carry the baggage of partition of carry the baggage of their losses and here is one people who have chosen not to i find them the most egalitarian the most large hearted the most generous people within our midst and this is truly laudable if we learned lessons from them of leaving the past behind of not carrying toxic baggage with us of standing up to offer help then i think there is a great deal to be said for us as a people one truly inspiring story i remember is about yogendra yadav yogendra yadav's dad saw some of his relatives i forget exactly who killed during the partition by muslims and he chose 
a middle name for his son Salim Yogendra Yadav's middle name is Salim because his dad did not want to carry that animus with him and he did not want it to change him and I find this deeply inspiring and you mentioned the elephant in the room I'm reminded of this poem by K Ryan which I'll read out it's called The Elephant in the Room by K Ryan the room is almost all elephant almost none of it isn't pretty much solid elephant so there's no room to talk about it so that's a poem but i feel that in our room there is a huge elephant but we can't talk about it so why delay that let's talk about the elephant in the room and i want to sort of before we get directly to the elephant in the room i'll also use this as a way to sort of explore your life itself because the sections the section that i really loved in uh, your book uh, but you don't look like a muslim is the first part where you speak about the dilemmas of identity where you wrestle with the question of are you a muslim indian or an indian muslim how it was to grow up how you would go to school and people would uh, you know ask you are you from pakistan do you have relatives in pakistan and so on and so forth tell me a little bit about this what was your sense of identity because on the one hand there is of course like you said that nehruvian india feeling of hope and moving forward together you know not you know shutting the tap when you're done with it because somewhere in a village there is someone walking to a well and there is that feeling is there but equally there is another layer of awareness that you have so tell me a sort of bit about you know how you grew up what the india of that time was like let me share a moment of epiphany one moment that i've described in the book also you may have read it it was uh, early 70s the war with pakistan had just happened i was in 5th standard and um, a boy in my class would constantly call me paki and i don't know what it meant at that point i must point out that in my family nobody really went to pakistan so we didn't have cousins or aunts and uncles there uh, there's no question of anybody coming from there um so our family was largely uh, up based and uh, um uh, had stayed put nobody had really gone uh, to pakistan so when this incident in school happened i remember coming home in tears and telling my father a man of great good sense uh, a doctor but a very uh, wise and a very sort of stable presence in my life uh, i told him that you know there's this boy and he keeps calling me paki and i don't know what it means so first he explained to me what paki meant he said it's a shortened version of pakistani so i said why does he call me pakistani we've never been there we until that point i mean I visited Pakistan 3 times as an adult all 3 times on professional work somebody called me for a seminar or university invited me a book launch thing happened things like that but till that point there was no relative no contact really so my father sat me down and we had this talk and I remember it to this day and I think it shaped me and my siblings and gave us a sense of identity so uh his words briefly were that look a uh, people of our generation the muslims had a choice uh, some of there were people who were going we chose not to go you and we all of us have every right to be in this country this country is as much yours and mine as it is anybody else's don't ever think that you don't have a right to be here this is your country mere dada mere dada ke dada unke dada isi shehar isi mulk mein isi matti mein dafan hai यहीं सो रहे हैं और मेरा भी जब वक्त आएगा मैं भी यहीं दफन होऊंगा तुम भी यहीं दफन होगी सोचो ये कि ये तुम्हारी जमीन है तुम्हारा मुल्क है तुम्हारा घर है अगर तुम ऐसे सोचोगी तो तुम्हें कभी कोई डरा नहीं पाएगा कोई धमका नहीं पाएगा और कहने को तो लोग बहुत कुछ कहेंगे लेकिन इट विल नॉट मैटर उस लड़के को कहने दो उसने ये लफ्ज़ कहीं सुना होगा बट इट डजेंट मैटर इट डजेंट मैटर वॉट ही सेंग उसके कहने से तुम पाकिस्तानी नहीं हो जाओगी so words to that effect that i think as um, when you were in fifth standard and somebody tells you very clearly very simply in very s- simple words that this is your home you are you are from this land from this zameen i think that gives you a sense of confidence and i think that confidence helped in very many ways the other thing my father told me was that the only key you have the key that will open doors for you is education because education opens you to and puts you on a level playing field if you do study and you do well in your studies um you know you have as much fighting chance as anybody else and it it, it gives puts you on on level ground 
I think that was uh, very good advice. I think education in India is the great leveler, not money. Education, I personally feel, and this was not just relevant in my generation. I think this is something that will continue to matter in a country as diverse as India. We are still grappling with differences. We are talking of mainstream. We are talking of minorities. We are talking of Dalits. We are talking of super Dalits. We are talking of farmers' rights. We are talking of tribals. We are talking of all the very many differences. But the one thing I think that can bring us on the same platform, I think. is still going to be education and it will continue to be relevant yes the differences will remain yes the differences can get exacerbated and can be used by political parties to further their ends but the one thing that will that will i think benefit us is the key that my father handed me the key that has continued to open door after door after door for me and that is education and i think if there are any young people listening to this i would say that use that key wisely because money will come and go it will come it will go away it will bring you some things but it will never bring you the wealth that education will and a good education a solid education so i would say that if we were to invest in our education and i don't just mean regular schooling but our education of the mind which comes from reading from being open to ideas of reading things apart from prescribed reading um of of not reading just whatsapp forwards that's the other thing uh, you know you have arguments with people where the other party is basing their entire argument on a whatsapp forward so i would say that whatsapp university is not in the business of giving out education that is just information that to miss information more often than not uh if only people would take the trouble to read to be to educate themselves and i'm not talking of just a degree based education of university college education but an education that comes from information from from uh, knowledge i think that knowledge stands you in good stead that allows you to hold your head high that allows you to have an opinion to have a clear unbiased opinion and not go by what people are saying also there is a herd mentality that is growing unfortunately regrettably it's growing by the day <clears throat> we have um, jo herd se alag hat ke baat karta hai ya soch rakhta hai hum badi jaldi mein usko keh dete hain you are anti national gaddar you know and we are using the word anti national as a slur as a, as a as a gali that we are hurling around i think soch rakhna aur bheer se alag soch rakhna anti nationalism nahi hai it is uh, having your own opinion that matters i think technology is all very good but technology is also being um being uh, misused may i share something that happened to me at this time last year please uh the year 23 uh, started on a very strange note for me on twitter somebody made a group called bully bai they identified muslim women i was one of them and they made an app on which uh, muslim women were being sold to work as bais in people's homes so my photograph was taken from somewhere and my name my photograph and they said that uh, people talk of lack of employment it was very in poor taste bad taste very cheap very hurtful and uh, in the bully by app it said that okay this is so and so with my name and face and uh, pe- she's a muslim she's a woman and people are saying that uh, there is unemployment and poverty among muslims so we as an act of philanthropy have set up this app and we have found all these muslim women to work as maids as bais in your home of course it was later taken down there was hue and cry there was solidarity there were messages of support from my friends and so on and so forth um uh, eventually some action was taken the people who were found who were behind this it hurt me it, i mean initially i was angry and so on when i saw the young people behind it that is when i was hurt 
what kind of toxic information are we feeding the youth of our country that they feel compelled to use their technical knowledge for something so cheap as this there is misogyny in this that you are uh, you are targeting women there is communalism in this that you're targeting muslim women but more importantly there is a sick mind at work that is sitting in some basement somewhere in some small town or village that has access to technology but is misusing that technology taking people's photographs taking people's personal information and seeing that they have views seeing that they have views that you don't agree with somebody is feeding these little people these little uh, uh, they are the workers they are the they are the pawns in the hands of larger forces who are being fed this information and what kind of mind comes up with an app called bully buy yeah and this is a follow up to something that happened before that was sully deals that was also misogynistic that was also communal what is happening now today is that young people are being given a very toxic mix of many things misogyny is one of them um she has a mind she is speaking up that's the other thing as a woman you're speaking up as a muslim woman you're speaking up so you're ticking all the wrong boxes in the process i think we are poisoning the minds of young people when we are encouraging them inciting them maybe giving them even money to come up with apps like this i think we need to be more watchful as a society lots to double click on but i'll point my listeners to this piece i'll link in the show notes written for scroll by your daughter it's a beautiful piece that's right where the first paragraph is a beautiful piece of writing where she uh, and i sent it to my writing students in fact and said you know i always keep saying go for the concrete and not the abstract and uh, the first three sentences are great where she writes my mother is a writer and a literary historian she bakes the best sourdough bread and loves going for walks in the rain she is called appa by almost everyone and is obsessed with red shoes and then she goes on I to write i came to your studio wearing them I I was watching your shoes. <laughs> I I felt it would Yeah, the same red shoes. Yes, I love them. They they, they are very nice red shoes. They're very comfortable the, for Delhi winters. They do, do yes. suit you very well. Yeah. So a bunch of larger questions I want to ask and you know what you said about what your father told you deeply moving reminded me of something Kapil Komereddy once uh, said on the show when he wrote Malevolent in Republic he said that every muslim who made a choice to stay in india showed a commitment to this nation that the hindus didn't have to the hindus who stayed just stayed out of inertia they didn't have to do anything there was no choice to make but every muslim had to actively make that choice that this is my vision of india this is my idea of india and i am committing to it with my life and i i find that uh, you know uh, very uh, deeply moving and powerful i'm also reminded of a, a point that you made eloquently again and again in your book is about how the muslims of india are not just one thing and islam is not just one thing you know there are so many multitudes there and i remember i done this episode with uh, mukulika banerji where we spoke about her book the pathan anamd and uh, in in your book you also mentioned khan abdul ghaffar khan you'd gone to afghanistan and there was a sort of a, um, a event in his honor and she said that what set her off on the quest of getting that phd and writing that book was was a question that hey the pathans are supposed to be a warrior race islam is supposed to be like a violent religion how the hell does this uh, non violent movement emerge from there and what she found through you know it took her 10 years to write the book is that all those stereotypes were nonsense that the non violence that came with the, that the khudai khidmatkar showed wasn't something borrowed from the west or the enlightenment it wasn't something inspired by gandhi it was it came organically from within that society from within islam and i found an echo of this also in your book when you quote from you know your uh, grandfather's autobiography khwab baki hai this is ali ahmed sarur your maternal grandfather yes. and i'll just quote these lines because i love them so much very right quote i am a muslimon and in the words of molana azad the caretaker of the 1300 years of the wealth that is islam my deciphering of islam is a key to the interpretation of my spirit i am also an indian and this indianness is as much a part of my being islam does not deter me from believing in my indian I identity again to quote molana azad if anything it shows the way and then later in the same pc writes the islam that i know gives more importance to hukuk ul ibad rights of the people rather than hukuk al allah 
rights of god uh, stock court and forgive my mispronunciations if any and uh, and so my i have a two part question for you here first is that your sense of yourself as a muslim because i imagine when you are a young child you have a muslim name you have all the external trappings that may or may not be there the rituals or whatever but later on there is obviously a deeper self that you've grappled with and embraced which is you know evident in all your essays and your writing and also simultaneously your sense of yourself as an indian what is an indian and what does that you know sort of mean to you yeah i think this is a journey um uh, and it's an ongoing journey i think um dekhiye kya kya dikhati hai duniya uh, we are living in a changing india i don't know what else awaits the next elections are going to be decisive so um 2024 is going to be a very important year so this extract that you read from my grandfather's autobiography khwab baqi hai it's nice but you know this business of dual identity is also troublesome uh i'm not just indian muslim muslim indian however whichever way you wish to say it i'm also a, a woman a wife a mother a sister a friend we all are multiple things we are the sum of our parts so uh i don't think one is just a tambram or a kashmiri pandit or a bengali bhadra you know so we are many many things i think it's it's not fair to straight jacket people uh yes a lot of my work and uh, engagement and querying and excavations have been about identity my own identity as a muslim in the past 20 odd years i don't think it bothered me especially in my growing up years that i was a muslim i had a muslim name yes but i went to a mainstream school i lived in a normal south delhi colony i don't think i had very many muslim friends we celebrated eid but then in our family we also celebrated diwali christmas holi everything so i didn't think of myself as especially muslim in any way even though i had a i, I spoke urdu i knew urdu uh, we spoke urdu at home all that was there but then uh, that consciousness wasn't there that i i must dwell upon or engage with in any way intellectually or emotionally with my religious identity i think it took 92 it took an ayodhya and the aftermath of uh, 92 for this consciousness to seep into it uh, i had begun writing by 92 i was translating at that point so in my literary career I, an engagement with identity the politics of identity began i if i were to look back with uh, uh ayodhya and in the run up to ayodhya i remember the yatra uh, yatras uh, that mr advani led i remember um, sort of being very concerned by them as a young person i remember reading about them very closely uh, looking out for the newspaper and reading we didn't have that much information technology back then so our information really came from news um, be it in the form of television news or or from what you read in the newspapers so i remember watching and following the rath yatra very closely and i remember uh being aware and conscious even then that this will have ramifications so when ayodhya happened and uh, uh then the bombay riots and all of the early 90s the very tumultuous time that we saw in this country post 92 leading up to the gujarat riots at the turn of the century all of these were worrying and concerned times for me as a person and i think the kind of writing i am now doing in the past odd years which is not just about my own anxieties about being muslim in india but it's also my anxiety about what is happening in the country i think i can trace this anxiety to that time the writing happened much later but the concern and the seeds for that concern were sown at that time uh, i think mr advani's emergence as a political leader is when i first became conscious that change is brewing that the country is changing that a cleft is being uh, driven in and from that time onwards i remember thinking more closely about it as i said the writing came later today i think the personal is political 
this is a slogan actually that came out from the third wave of the feminist movement and it was used by the feminists to talk about excavating their own lives to take to make larger political points but i think it's not just confined to the feminist movement for each one of us living in very politically charged times the personal is the political and i certainly believe in it i excavate my own life my own experiences and i'm happy to see that my daughter is doing the same thing uh, the essay that you referred to i remember uh, it was about this time last year we were sitting in the winter sun and uh, she was typing away furiously on her laptop and she turned her hurt into an essay into a political essay and i'm very proud of that and in the essay that you read an extract from she talks about how you know that there's communalism in the world you know that there's misogyny in the world you know that there are trolls out there sitting somewhere and writing out all kinds of nonsense but when it hits close to home when it happens to your mother when that person is writing about your mother who is your sanctum sanctorum that is when you realize what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a muslim woman in the world so she mined a personal experience to write a political essay and i was very proud of that because i think that is what also what i have been trying to do for instance i was looking for a house to rent and the difficulties i had in finding a house to rent why because my husband and i are muslims with clearly muslim names and there's no fig leaf of a kabir or some name like that where you could be anybody so with names like ours that was the first dead giveaway and so i've used experiences from my own life to make larger political comments i think we live in a time in our history as a country as a people where we can't afford to say let's not make it political it is political everything around us is political a lot of my friends for even the kathua rape they say don't make it political but it is political what is not political in today's day and age so i see politics all around me i see goodness also all around me i'm not i'm not completely looking at the world with a jaundiced view i i see support and solidarity also coming i see a uh, people speaking up against uh, bigotry in different forms also uh, like i said when this happened to me last year there was support and solidarity messages from friends from random strangers people writing uh, uh, posts on facebook so there are two sides to the coin uh, sometimes it seems as though the flood of hate and toxicity will overwhelm you but every now and then something happens that restores your faith uh, in in humanity i think i've strayed very far from the question you asked me which was about identity but i think identity cannot be seen through a binary you are just like cities you are also the sum of your parts your experiences your interactions with people your past all of this shapes your identity or your understanding of that identity my understanding of my identity might be very different from another muslim woman's right so uh, everything is is individual but i think talking about it helps uh, the first thing is to talk about it to bring it out in the open to uh, say yes uh, this is troubling let's talk about it i think that's a good way to approach this business of othering this business of uh, uh, of of somebody pointing a finger and saying you are different so let's talk of those differences I want to ask my next question by first beginning it with the, the, these really powerful lines in your book where you speak about how you were in some other country with a delegation and you were asked to wear a abaya and a hijab <laughs> that and was in Saudi Arabia in Saudi Arabia and you spoke about them as tools of exclusion and you had these great lines quote its dense blackness turns it into a portable inferno at such times the only thought in my head was i wish the men were to wear it occasionally then they might know how it feels stop quote and i love this feeling of inversion that i wish the men knew how it feels because i often think that in my really lucky charmed life there there were layers of awareness i never had to had and only came to realize later for example i i, I think most indian men do not know what it is 
that extra layer that women carry with them like every time you're on a deserted street you're looking around or every time you go out late every time you enter a lift you're seeing who all is there and men are just completely oblivious we don't have to do that shit and similarly there must be many layers which you know indian muslims go through which we may not realize for example at one point in your book you just speak about all these depictions in popular culture for example you write quote in pre globalization india the film industry routinely depicted muslims as smugglers or as pan chewing surma wearing huge lumps dressed in pathan suits or as kawali singing debauch men who divorce their wives for the most frivolous of reasons stop quote and i have of course seen all these films and i never thought there was something odd because you just see a film as entertainment you just see it but i imagine if you're a muslim seeing it there must be this little bit of unease that is sort of there in you you also describe this beautiful experiment your friend mayan kostan sufi carried out and i'll link to his essay as well where he did all the things he normally does going on a bus reading a book etc etc except he wore a white skull cap and he just wanted to see how people reacted differently to him and i remember once i went to a gathering of friends and it happened to be eid which i didn't even know and i was wearing a pathan suit a salwar kurta and there were a bunch of strangers that i hadn't met before and the the hostility with which they looked at me till my host introduced me and told my name at which point everything softened and no one in my life has looked at me like that yeah. right and and later of course i found out that these were like pretty hardcore they would go to shakhas and all that on the weekends but leaving that aside i want you to sort of for all of my listeners and for me who may not be aware tell me about that extra layer you've carried with you you know despite your privileges yeah. th- there is that layer of awareness yeah the privileges of education do sort of you think isolate you and uh, uh, cushion you from from this kind of outright communalism but sometimes it doesn't i wrote a long essay for the wire um where i start by talking about an exp- Uh, by an experience uh, i was at a lit fest i won't mention the name of the city or the organizers but it was in a foreign country we were sitting in a bar i was wearing de- jeans and a shirt um, i have short hair uh, i was like anybody else uh, the organizers had taken us to a bar where we were having uh, uh, some snacks before the dinner which was somewhere else there was a bunch of us writers all from india attending that lit fest and um we were all talking and then at some point the host said oh let's have a round of uh, 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 introductions because we were from different cities and some knew each other some didn't so i gave my name and there was one person again whose name i will not take he occupies a very high position in the present dispensation and who had been talking to me all this while because like i said i look like a regular person i look like one of us you don't look like a muslim that's the name of my book so i didn't look like a muslim when he heard my name he just clammed up he did not speak to me for the rest of the evening going back to our hotel it just so happens that he and i and one other person were sharing a cab the only time he addressed me uh, after having heard my name was when we were going back and he asked me a very sharp very pointed very nasty question now the only thing i am left to assume from this whole experience is that everything changed the moment he heard my name we are all writers we are all adults we are all in a foreign country we are all indians we are all indian writers you would imagine that my privilege of education of being a writer amongst fellow writers of being a regular person i am not wearing a hijab i am not talking about islam i am not defending anything uh, we are having a regular conversation about books writing whatever what sets me apart just the fact that i happen to have a muslim name and till that point i had made no sharp political comments nothing to give away my political views so what is it that makes me different from everybody else those 8 10 people in that bar at that point just the fact that i have a muslim name yeah now this is one example that i i used then uh, in that essay for the wire you're welcome to see it i think the essay is called um does a muslim rose smell different from a hindu rose yeah, or I'll something like that from the show notes i have read it yeah. so yeah yeah so something like that now Uh, this this comes from gertrude stein's very famous statement that a rose is a rose is a rose which means that you are what you are but uh, 
in india is a rose a rose a rose or is a hindu rose different from a muslim rose that is the question we need to ask ourselves so yes uh, every now and then whether i mentioned earlier the difficulty you have in finding a house on rent if you happen to be a muslim uh, if you go through a property dealer they'll agree and then when you go to the house and they they come to know your name then they say oh we want uh, vegetarian tenants you know which is ridiculous because if you're giving your house in rent you don't have to eat in the house you know you you should be concerned whether they can pay the rent or not but no a lot of people don't wish to do that i'm told it's more so in bombay where the societies have a lot more control so the housing societies decide uh whether it's not just muslim but whether we want only gujaratis or we want only marathis and so on but for us in delhi this was new so i found it very alarming but yes there are small everyday instances such as um, the use of slur words like katwa for a muslim you know what it means yeah of course um mia less uh, less uh, uh, offensive but, but as hostile as benign uh, seemingly benign but definitely a form of othering yeah or the use of bhai for name so and so bhai just call him by the name he doesn't need it or something benign but also othering asking a muslim to recite an urdu poetry at a farewell function all muslims don't know urdu all muslims certainly don't know urdu poetry urdu is not the language of all muslims a uh, muslim from kerala has no reason to know urdu or know urdu poetry has a muslim from assam or from madhya pradesh or from somewhere else need not know urdu right so this i ha- i find very very strange that at a farewell function the mic always stops in front of so and so and say falane mia ab aap ek acha sa sheer suna dijiye supposing that person doesn't know it why is this assumption this stereotype it's not it's not offensive but it's troubling so the stereotypes and the othering has a wide spectrum yeah so you have the deeply offensive one the katwa and the other things and you have the slightly less offensive ones like mia and then you have the kindly but patronizing ones yeah so there are different ranges and then as i've said in my book uh, in the essay but you don't look like a muslim a lot of people say you know if more muslims were like you we wouldn't have a problem wow the problem is who are you to have a problem in the first place why do you have a problem the fact that you have a problem is your problem not mine yeah but the people who are saying it are oblivious to the irony of what they are saying looks are the most deceptive things i may look like a regular person but supposing i have a rebellious heart that is planning all kinds of insurgencies what are you going to do about that yeah so this business of stereotypes uh, not just for indian muslims for anybody tam brahms kashmiri pandits are you are a south indian but why are you so fair you know <laughs> that kind of thing the use of words for people from the northeast i won't even repeat those words but i went to delhi university where which was a huge melting pot of people from different parts of the country and as young people we didn't realize how offensive some of them were the nicknames we had for people from bihar the really offensive word we use for people from the northeast i'm not saying indian muslims are the only ones singled out but i am saying that a country as plural as multicultural as diverse as ours needs to be more mindful of the use of words as labels for people from a region from a caste from a community and they need to understand how offensive this can actually be even if it's seemingly benign You, you write in a book about how there are these motifs in popular culture like love jihad and like uh, making a noise on friday at mosques and you know killing cows and so on and so forth and the thing is while there has been a, a resurgence of these themes in our politics today these are actually really old themes like i've done episodes with akshay mukul and in his great book on the geeta press he talks about how love jihad and cow slaughter were absolutely live raging issues in the 1920s these have been with us for a long time and in fact reading his book was an important moment for for me because 
I realized uh, through a course of various conversations that I had actually grown up in a bubble. I grew up in this English speaking urban sort of bubble which thought, okay, you know, all of India is broadly secular and cosmopolitan and there's a violent fringe somewhere, but they don't matter. And I, I realized I was a fringe. I realized that our culture was that th this strain was a, a very large and very dominant strain in our society and you could say what has happened over the last few years is that politics has caught up with society but our society was always like this now am i being unnecessarily bleak do you agree with this because it's true that all of these are expressed with more vociferousness and with more a greater show of power today than it was before but is it the case that our society itself changed or is it the case that hey you know we were always like this and those of us who wanted a liberal india failed in that project to build it from the bottom up akshay mukul is perfectly right in saying that these things have always been an issue at least for 100 years if not more from the turn of the century uh, early 20th century onwards why i just love jihad and cow slaughter hindi urdu debate from the early 20th century was was an issue and in the years the half century leading up to the partition 47 freedom these were issues that were there they were subsumed in other issues such as the freedom struggle uh, and that brought people together on a common platform the enemy then was the other the imperialist power that was ruling us so the divide and rule policy and other things so issues were there they were always there they were simmering away in the backdrop they would be fanned every now and then in by little knots of people and they would gain currency in small areas but i think i will not agree with you that uh, upbringings and childhoods like yours and mine were uh, the exception to the rule i think they were pretty broad based i don't think we were the minority i think we were if not the majority uh, we were certainly fairly mainstream i would say in most big cities across india this was the norm that people said okay let's talk of education let's talk of upward mobility let's talk about buying new tv new washing machine new whatever consumerism all of this see it as a chronology first there was the freedom struggle you had to you had to fight for a common cause you know set aside your differences fight for the freedom struggle in the years after 47 let's build a stable society so i'm not saying there were no communal outrages yes we had communal rights we had all of that uh, but i think people kept a lot of things on the back burner there were wars with pakistan but even that we largely said let's get on with the business of nation building well as put our shoulder to the wheel we had a hindi film cinema telling us chodo kal ki baatein kal ki baat purani aao milkar likhe nayi kahani we had a whole and let's not diss the importance of hindi cinema in shaping us as a people i think the crop of progressive poets that we have kafi azmi majru akhtar sultan puri all of these people the kind of songs they wrote for hindi cinema they talked about building bridges they talked about finding common projects insaan ki aulad hai insaan banega to hindu banega na musalman banega sahir is writing this so a whole bunch of films came out which talked of humanity of 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 you know looking for commonalities you know of hindus raising a muslim child and so on and so forth so all of this was happening and i think this played a very significant role popular culture played a very significant role in in bringing people together and making sure they stayed together so they showed holi being celebrated by uh, diwali being celebrated by a muslim family ads being made about tea companies welcoming a muslim neighbor welcoming a hindu neighbor so all of popular culture was doing this now we have just the opposite happening popular culture information technology everything is coming together to divide so this mainstream that you and i occupied that normal happy childhood that you and i occupied had despite the age difference that you and i have but largely we grew up in a similar sort of india you grew up in chandigarh or and i lived in delhi but i think these were not aberrations i think it would be too cynical uh to say that uh, we lived in a bubble or we lived a dream i think we lived a real india an india we can possibly still reclaim there is still time there is always time till there is no time so i think what is now happening is that having reached a level of prosperity 
we are a rich nation there is a lot of superfluous money uh you see it in the conspicuous consumption of wealth and the weddings and all that we talked about uh, there is all of that now there is time and technology is aiding and abetting us in this othering that we are doing so the love jihad the cow slaughter the hindi urdu business all of this is being fanned not in isolated small mini fires but in raging fires uh, my fear is that that we shouldn't allow that fear to engulf us as a society every now and then a sane voice stands up and allows that to be you know snuffed out but there are also forces at work that are encouraging these fires to rage and to blaze and to keep adding fodder to this to keep adding fuel to this a love jihad was a loosely applied word now no less than the supreme court of india has used it in one of the judgments what happens you give currency you give legitimacy to a fringe word that is floating around when you start using it in your judgments when you start using it in your in your court observations then you lend give it legitimacy so what is happening is that greater legitimacy is being given to things that you and i considered fringe so what was the fringe is increasingly occupying center stage it is coming away from the margins and it is occupying a center stage in our lives in our society in in the world that we live in that is definitely worrying let me build a thought experiment for you and for my listeners uh, leading uh, up to a question but first a little bit of the setting of the stage i kind of agree with everything you said and i think about you know if there are different strains within indian society like there's that old cliche or whatever you say about india the opposite is true so let's say we are illiberal in some ways but we are liberal in the in many of our lived realities like our cuisines and our clothes and our culture is such a delightful kitchery so let's say that we are liberal in those ways and but one strain takes over and becomes dominant now when i think of the reasons that happened two of the reasons are actually really good things overall one opening up to the world economy that lifts hundreds of millions of people out of poverty but what it also does as a side effect is that it again lifts hundreds of millions of people into a middle class which has these traditional conservative beliefs and hindutva is propelled forward by that and i still think the 91 liberalization is a massive net positive just for the humanitarian good it did but this is a side effect equally i think the technological growth of the last 20 years is miraculous it's a huge net positive but as you correctly said what it has also done is that it has amplified the worst instincts of our nature it it plays to our tribalism it is easy to use technology to hack minds as it were and to sort of polarize us and to completely destroy the discourse and and that has happened and i see these with a bit of bewilderment because for me the economic opening up and te- the technology coming in is a huge net positive but these things have happened now here's the thought experiment the thought experiment is supposing we do a groundhog day we start in 1947 we let the future unfold my question is that if we do a groundhog day say 100 times you know does this toxic exclusive does this toxic strain win out uh, every time or are there counter scenarios when maybe we move in a better direction what takes us there can we have the economy without the hindutva can we have the technology without the polarization uh, if i ask you to think aloud on this what are your thoughts yeah i think it's a universally acknowledged truism that the middle class the world over not just in india is conservative and not just conservative that men no ki ten no ki thing we talked about there is that there is um, i think it's it's a less uh, once it occupies a conservative uh, comfortable space i think it is less open to um, thinking of the others it wants to to consolidate its own position and of people like them i think the middle class is less interested in lifting and pulling people out of poverty it is more interested in its own further upward mobility there is all of that 
but to come back to your thought experiment i think uh, if our groundhog day is uh, 15th august 1947 and we have the v- future waiting to unfurl before us what is it that we would have wanted yes we would have wanted uh, i think the slow opening up of the economy was actually very good for us i personally think i'm not even an economist far from being a political economist in my limited opinion and my lay understanding I think the gradual opening up was very good for us because all this swadeshi that we talk about actually was put into practice. I think our cars, our soaps, our shampoos, our food, yes we had food shortages. We went through terrible food shortages also in that time. But remember the green revolution also happened in this country. The white revolution, the milk uh, the amul experiment in Gujarat. All of these happened despite a closed economy. So again correct me if i'm wrong and as i say i'm not an economist or not a political economist but i seem to think that the slow opening up the slow pace of development was very good we compare ourselves with let's if we were to compare ourselves with pakistan we set out on the same trajectory on the same day the same moment in time but look how far we have come and look what a mess pakistan has made of itself of its society of its economy and at the moment at the moment its economy is in shambles uh, i think the greatest good that came to us was our constitution we took our time over that too it was not drafted in a hurry um, dr ambedkar and the framers of our constitution took their own time there was a lot of criticism at that time at the snail space in which it was being drafted but i think the thought and wisdom and the 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 kind of uh, you know the worrying that went into it is for the larger good and the fact that it's a work in progress every time something is added to it from the top of my head i can think of so many things that are given to us as a right that uh, we are not always mindful of uh, we had no suffragette movement right uh, the voting rights were given to men and women from day 1 we had never had to women never had to fight for the vote um there is amazing maternity benefits we have no glass ceiling i mean in 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 theory in the law there is no glass ceiling we of course had a woman prime minister but even otherwise i mean women can do anything there is the panchayati raj system and the women's bill that's all later but the constitution itself guarantees you equality for men and women maternity benefits i was reading somewhere that our maternity benefits are actually at par with so many developed countries you know i mean norway sweden have very evolved very thought out maternity benefits america on the other hand fares very poorly when it comes to getting women back in the workforce our lawmakers very early decided that a abortion has been legal for a very long time in india you know we've never had a roe versus raid raid uh, in india because we we decided that you know abortion should be legalized maternity benefits if i'm not mistaken you get 3 months of paid service and more of half paid and then unpaid service unlike america we are not saying women when they become mothers should not enter the workforce we are helping them take time with the family and then enter the workforce when they want India even has miscarriage leave how many countries do that india has paternity leave less so but it's there india has this amazing thing of 2 years leave which you can break over the years if you are in a teaching job or something and you have a child taking a board exam or you want to do renovations to your house you can take leave and then go back to your job your job is waiting for you unlike the us if you take time out to be a mother you're not sure if the job is waiting for you so i think we got many things right in our journey over the years so from your g- groundhog day to now we did many things well somewhere we allowed the canker of communalism to take over i don't say this just because i'm an indian muslim I say this because I and I think a lot of non-muslims also agree with me that the one big issue we have today is the bigotry is the hatred is the communalism we are doing right in so many fronts yes we could have done better yes the economy could have 
developed better yes all of that again i don't have the skills to analyze that or have an informed opinion on that on inflation and so on i think we are largely doing well uh, when we look at ourselves look at our education system we have been providing engineers and doctors to the world for a very large for a very long time in the it sector we've been booming for a very long time there was talk of brain drain and so on but uh, that says that there was a wealth of knowledge here that was being uh, sent out to the rest of the world silicon valley was sort of nurtured by indian talent uk doctors uk hospitals are manned by indian nurses indian doctors so there is all of that we've got it right on so many fronts but yes the one thing where uh, not got uh, our act together is farmers rights tribal rights minority rights i think these are things that need more thought i think that that th- these are things that cannot be brushed under the carpet and you know glossed over by this large talk of uh, development and vikas vikas is, they say sabka saath sabka vikas but it has to be not just a slogan it has to be a lived reality there are schemes like the manarega and other schemes that are reaching out to the poorest of poor uh which are giving employment and money to the poorest of poor um there are gaps there are chinks there are cracks often uh things don't always make it to the to the intended people but the schemes are there and they are good schemes they are talk of social justice they're talking of you know uh, uh, the last person which is also by the way a very gandhian concept the last person you know the person at the end of the row that is your target you have to reach the last girl the last child the last person so i think we are a socially aware society and state um i must share with you a very interesting conversation i had from a friend from slovakia former soviet union uh, uh she's a friend who was staying with me and we were driving around delhi and i would point at at various places and say oh this is a government housing society i'd point at ina or sarojini nagar or the various societies and colonies and neighborhoods that are for government uh, servants for bureaucrats or you know people in the lower rungs of the administrative machinery and she was amazed she says you know i come from an erstwhile soviet union country and we were a socialist state I don't remember any housing societies for governments we lived in regular houses our parents lived in they were all working for the state but there was state was and then she ended up by saying you guys are more socialist than us you you've been more socialist than we ever were and i don't think being socialist is a dirty word i think we were a state that was very mindful of the people who worked uh, for the state i think we gave them many benefits we I mean housing being one of them of course but the socialism that was there that to- there is talk now of removing it from the uh, uh, constitution um i think that was not such a bad idea that we were a socialist secular democratic republic all of these were good things there's talk of removing some of those words that is cause for alarm So I I completely agree with you about the canker of communalism um and how toxic and dangerous it is for us and by the way I I gave you a thought experiment and instead of being speculative you were descriptive but thanks for that anyway but uh, while agreeing with you about that toxic canker I actually disagree about almost about everything else in the sense that economically I think keeping hundreds of millions in poverty for decades longer than necessary was a, a massive humanitarian harm I've had many episodes on this while the constitution is more liberal than our society I felt it wasn't liberal enough that it goes too far not in protecting the people from the state but in protecting the state from the people many of our rights like the right to free speech isn't really a right at all it is so diluted by all the exceptions and by all the amendments that happened so yes i agree with you about all the positive things in our constitution but many of them are diluted and many of them were done away with it like the right to property no longer being a fundamental right and i've had episodes about that as well and it is with reason that ambedkar in fact i think in the mid 50s said that if i could i would burn down this constitution that is how the solution he had become uh, as for the word socialist it was actually not in the original ambedkar's preamble it was added by indira 
yeah. and i think the word is used in different senses and one sense is a good for society broad general sense someone like me i put my economics hat on and you know i'll i'll look at it as you know the public ownership of all property no private property and all that and that's terrible has been a disaster everywhere uh, but i i don't think that is a sense in uh, which you mean it it's used in a very different way sometimes in india such as for example by the progressive writers movement which you've used written about so much and which i admire as well so we can speak about that and even you know you mentioned the maternity leave i was I used to edit a policy magazine called Pragati, and I had pieces by economists like Devika Kher and Suman Joshi. I link them from the show notes. That when the last maternity law came about, it actually hurt women more than it helped them uh, in terms of the job losses that happened because the incentives for companies changed. So many of these well-meaning laws, like all our labor laws and maternity laws, actually hurt the intended recipient. But they can make elites feel good. Ki ha, humne sahi cheez kia, and I think we need to look a little deeper. Uh, 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 you know, even our education yeah, system. Yeah, I, I think women's participation in the workforce is dipping i mean we compare with bangladesh we don't fare too yeah. well and I, I, there I, are varying uh, elements too i'm not saying that but i was hoping to really look at the at the better uh, at the, the good sides. things no no yeah. i've i've had great episodes with yeah. shana patichari and amita bhandari on women's workforce participation and it's just really depressing and yeah. it's multifactorial there are so many causes uh, but anyway uh, you know let's take yeah, a but quick the state has tried to be a pater familias which is yeah. not too bad yeah I mean, and getting it wrong sometimes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, but let us not turn this into an argument about economics. I have hmm. so much to learn from you. I feel like this conversation has just begun. So let's take a quick commercial break, recharge our batteries, and then let's continue. Have you always wanted to be a writer but never quite gotten down to it? Well, I'd love to help you. Since April 2020, I've enjoyed teaching 27 cohorts of my online course, The Art of Clear Writing, and an online community has now sprung up of all my past students. We have workshops, a newsletter to showcase the work of students, and vibrant community interaction. In the course itself, through four webinars spread over four weekends, I share all I know about the craft and practice of clear writing. There are many exercises, much interaction, and a lovely and lively community at the end. of it the course costs rupees 10000 plus gst or about 150 dollars if you're interested head on over to register at indiauncut.com/clearwriting that's indiauncut.com/clearwriting being a good writer doesn't require god given talent just a willingness to work hard and a clear idea of what you need to do to refine your skills i can help you Welcome back to the scene in the unseen. I'm chatting with Rakshinda Jalil, and I will take you back in time. I will take you back in time by about an hour and a half way towards the start of the show. You were talking about how, uh, and and a very wise and important point that. just for a family being wealthy doesn't matter kids also have to grow up in an atmosphere where they can feel that they are reading books uh for leisure for no particular purpose i couldn't agree with that more strongly because i think a lot of learning that happens happens in a goal directed way ki iit entrance exam karna hai mba karna hai everything is goal directed and that's a terrible way to read and that's not really an education and you were speaking about a much broader approach to education and i think a lot of that education in a sense happens by osmosis when there is that mahal around you so to say so i want to take you back to your childhood and ask you about you know in that forming of you the shaping of you what was the kind of mahal what kind of books were you reading what were your parents like your grandparents like tell me a bit about those things books were a very important part in our life uh, in our homes uh, i think that we always had more books and furniture definitely i can say that and it continues to be so you know in uh, in the south of india you often notice that people take off their shoes before they enter their homes even in parts of bombay i've seen it at the well, yeah, yeah so ghar ke darwaze pe aap jooto utar ke andar jate hain to it was a bit like that in our home with english we were all bilingual we used english for our day to day lives my both my parents uh, as well as us my siblings and i but when we entered our home we left english behind like people leave their slippers at the door and we spoken urdu good spoken uh, everyday hindustani let's say uh i think that made us richer uh because uh, 
Our everyday conversation was peppered with bits of sheer o shayari, with the kissas, with kahaniyon ke references, with filmon ke references, with the uh, uh, fragments of um, you know. It was it was flavorsome, it was rich, it was idiomatic, and it had cross references across literary cultures. So, uh, for example, if somebody was speaking very softly, you would say. ये क्या बात हुई मैं कहूँ मेरा कमर बंद सुने और इफ समबडी वॉज पीपिंग फ्रॉम बिहाइंड द डोर एंड ट्राइंग टू ईव स्टॉप देन समन वुड से साफ छुपते भी नहीं सामने आते भी नहीं यू नो सो द रेफरेंसेज टू पोइट्री टू नॉट जस्ट उर्दू पोइट्री बट अदर काइंड ऑफ पोइट्री ऑल ऑफ दिस आई थिंक मेड आर स्पोकन लैंग्वेज माई सिबलिंग्स एन आई दैट मच रिच आई थिंक दैट मेड आर कम्युनिकेशन स्किल्स i think i would like to believe that much more stronger so first and foremost this emphasis that was given not in a diktat manner but in a very organic very natural manner by my parents to mother tongue was important and this is a lesson i learned as a parent that let the child be very proficient in the mother tongue whatever it might be tamil bangla urdu hindi whatever and let them pick up english as an effective uh, uh, language for everyday use later it does you no harm if your first language is your mother tongue and english is an acquired but but good uh, proficient uh, proficiency in that but an acquired language that was one thing you asked about books uh it saddens me when i hear of homes where not forget books but not even a newspaper is subscribed to books of course are not but the the father will pick up a newspaper at the office and read or they'll get their information on a twitter feed or on whatsapp or whatever so why waste those whatever 200 something rupees that costs or maybe now it's 500 i'm not sure so whatever is the bill for your newspaper is that such a huge saving yeah so newspaper is one thing books are a distant dream in many families they will buy books uh, that are prescribed reading maybe in courses even that now people i think are taking xeroxes how much richer do you get by saving on this is this the first economy that you do is this the only economizing you do you will continue to order food from outside you will continue to eat out you will continue to go to the beauty parlor you'll continue to do whatever it is you will not economize in your grocery bills but you will like to economize when it comes to books and reading material i think the worst thing we do is when we xerox a book even for uh, we we are cheating somebody of their copyright yeah we cheating somebody of their royalty so we don't realize but it's a form of theft it's a form of pilferage actually when we even for our prescribed books we read a xerox and the message and the values we are passing on to our young is that it's okay to cheat and and steal because you are stealing you are taking away somebody's royalty for that book when you don't buy the book and instead you get it xeroxed and you're reading a bastardized version of an original book that is one the learning that you get from outside the classroom i am not dissing classroom education it's very important and it is the foundation is the bedrock on which a lot of your other learning happens but the education the information the 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 knowledge that you get from outside the classroom from non prescribed texts is very important in my own home i found a uh, an array of reading material my father read shikar books so there was always a stack of jim corbett's shikar stories on his bedside tables there was a lot of urdu detective fiction uh, ibn safi he has been made very fashionable because he has been translated into english by shamsur rahman farooqi and uh, it's been published in english the english translations and there is a lot of interest in vernacular detective fiction suddenly in india there is a surge of it so suddenly ibn safi is a name that is cropping up but in my childhood these are books i remember seeing on my father's a doctor by profession reading a lot of crime fiction a lot of shikar fiction books on palmistry books on a range of subjects my mother was a librarian in our school so she not only had a very well stocked library and extremely well stocked and diverse for a school library but i think the high point of her life was the two book fairs that happened in delhi 
the annual one, trade fair one, and one other book fair. And that is when she, uh, she was at her happiest because she had this unlimited budget from her school to go and buy new books. And what I learned from my mother was the joy she got out of sharing a good book. I have seen her with a gleam in her eye hand over a new book to a student saying, ye padho, ye nai kitab aai hai. And that's something I like to do with young people that I know. I don't have a library, but from my own personal library, I like to share books. But I insist on having them back because I think you need to respect books. Uh, also, what I learned from my mother is a never to lick a a book with your with your you know lick your finger and turn the page. She thought that was the height of bad manners. You don't leave spit for other users to use. She also taught us not to uh, write and underline and mark on borrowed books. If it's your own book, by all means, make notes. But if it's a borrowed book belonging to a library or to somebody else, do not make markings because it's it's somebody else's property. So the respect for books, of not tearing books, of not stealing books. I mean, I can die a thousand deaths, but I will never steal a book from a library. I cannot do it. It's just not in my DNA to do that. So yeah, books were a very important part of my life and uh, my very middle class parents with their limited earnings made sure that we never scrimped on books. We may or may not buy expensive branded clothes, footwear, this or that, but they never said no to us when we wanted to buy books. Uh, a big part of our pocket money went into buying books. A big part of our outing were the book fairs. In my growing up years, there were a lot of... Um, book exhibitions at places like Sapru House, for example. I don't know if that still happens, but I remember my mother taking us to all of these book exhibitions where we were encouraged to buy books. So I think children learn from their family and from elders. So if you have, I know a lot of mothers who buy books as birthday gifts for other kids, but not for their own. Why? Because a book is usually cheaper than an expensive gift. So the economics of it makes sense to buy a book as a birthday gift, but not necessarily for your own child. And the irony of it is mind-boggling. If you think a book is good, why buy it as a gift for somebody else's kid and why not buy it for your own kid? So start by buying books, start by having books around the house. I think that's important. And as parents, we need to do that for our kids to do it. Um, you know, the lockdown was a very difficult time for so many of us. And I think our two favorite stores here in Delhi, Midlands and uh, Fakir Chand in Khan Market, Midlands in Aurobindo, I think they did a yeoman service by having free pick and drop and free home delivery of books and it saw us through uh, my children and i were, were ordering books and they were coming home uh, you know by home delivery and i think that made the long months of the lockdown that much easier with reading material for us as a family i think standalone bookshops need to be respected because they are fighting a battle in this day and age where fewer and fewer people are buying books. Um, the bookstore chains, the big chains in the malls are still doing okay. But the family-owned bookshops are, I think, the last of the Mohicans. They need to be supported. They need our support uh, by whatever means we can. Amazon Books gives you bigger discounts, so we think it's okay to buy, if at all we buy books, we think it's okay to buy books from Amazon. But I would urge you to go to your neighborhood bookstore, identify a bookstore in your neighborhood, support their business, because not just because it's a small business, but because it needs our support and is doing great work. These community libraries that I see sprouting in parks, I think these are a great idea. Don't throw away your books. Don't give them to kabadiwalas for a pittance. Instead, um, I see them in a lot of parks and community you know, spaces. You have a little covered bookshelf to protect it from the elements and you keep your books there and you have a... Uh, have it closed but without a lock. People can walk away with what they want and they can replenish it with what they don't need to keep in their own homes. So like you have food banks in some places, I think book banks is a great idea. 
if in our housing societies, in our neighborhoods, in our parks, in our community spaces, if we were to have these book banks, I think we will fill the lacuna of those homes that don't have books, that don't buy books. I think these are things that are very doable at no great expense. I'm feeling incredibly jealous of you, even mad at you, because I am from Bombay and we don't have good bookstores there. I come to Delhi, you have such good bookstores yeah, here. And yeah. If I may say so, Bangalore is even better. Uh, you know, Blossoms is practically my favorite space in the whole world, yeah. just because of that section of secondhand books at the back. It's Absolutely. just so beautiful. And Bangalore does that Atagalata festival, also mm. by run by a bookstore, sponsored by a bookstore, which go. is amazing. Which is amazing. I'm. I mean, uh, one of my favorite stories from this podcast is uh, when I had a dear friend of mine Suresh Rai on the show and I'm not sure I remember the story in all its details but I'll get the gist of it right that he had an early job and I think he was in Baroda and his first salary was 7,000 or 8,000 or whatever and he took it to a bookstore and he just gave all that money to that guy and said sir I want to build reading as a habit but I don't know what to buy so you take this money and you pick me books which you, you oh, think nice. I should read and then that bookstore owner didn't just take random books he spent a few hours and he actually curated a collection for my friend and I find oh, that's, nice. that's such very a beautiful story very heartwarming one place where I think there is a dharam sankat that I am feeling now is when you speak of uh, like I completely agree with you that back in the days eroxing a book would be a really bad idea you're denying royalties but today often what happens is now I buy a lot of books I buy more than a book a day almost but when there is a book that I simply cannot get any other way either it is not available or it's more than 2000 bucks I will take the pirated pdf of course I will just take it because I think knowledge is important and where, whereas I will always pay if I can if I can't then you know what am I to uh, do in one of your books I won't name which one I wasn't available on Amazon but it was there was a pirated version of it so there you go it do is do tell me because maybe I don't know about this <laughs> it is what it is I'll, I'll, I'll look it up and I'll yeah. tell you I did download that particular no I agree where something is not available and you do need it then of course I mean you take a Xerox you get a pirated version whatever because you do need to read that I agree but I was making a larger statement about entirely. about royalties and how um, we have no other I mean those of us who don't have a day job those of us who are full-time writers, our only source of income is the pittance. We are not Chetan Bhagat. Our royalty is not running into lakhs and crores, you see. We get very modest sums of money, but this is a life we chose. Nobody put a gun to our head and said, become a writer. This is a life we chose to live. These were decisions we chose to make. At least speaking for myself, I chose to give up the the luxuries and benefits of a full-time job with all the PF and the medical and the this and that and chose to become a writer. And, you know, I'm a loose cannon. I can write on what I want for whom I want on whatever subject I want. But it comes with its pitfalls, which is namely money. Uh, and money is scarce, especially in the niche areas that I work on. I work mostly on literary histories, translations. Nobody is giving me a fortune by way of, uh, of, of, of royalties. So the little royalty I get, and it truly is paltry, believe me, it's nowhere close to a salary. Had I stuck to, let's say, teaching, I would have been making X amount of money. I don't make a fraction of that as a writer. Given my uh, the fact that I write many books, I'm fairly prolific, but it still doesn't add up to a lot of money. So therefore, uh, royalty, little though it is, matters to me. And not just f because it matters to me, but as a matter of principle, I think for any writer, royalty is important, which is why people should buy books. I say this as a blanket statement, not uh, taking into account specifics that a book is not available or out of print That's or whatever. Right. But by and large, I think we should try and buy uh, non-pirated books. No, no, I uh, agree with you entirely. And at this point, I will give an injunction to everyone listening to this to immediately go books. out and buy Rakshinda's books first, but any books, just kind of uh -huh. uh, uh, buy them. Thank you. Here's my next question, which is, uh, I also want to know specifically about which books moved you, who were the writers who influenced you, and also how was that experience, which I was not fortunate enough to have, unfortunately, I, I just read in one language, which was English, but you were reading in multiple languages. So what was that experience like? Because it is really like inhabiting multiple worlds, in a sense, if you have those languages. And also, I guess reading multiple languages would inform the writing you do in any one of them, which in your case is English. Absolutely. So tell me a bit 
bit about um, you know how the world of literature takes shape in your head as you are growing up you know cross fertilization is very important and uh, cross fertilization of ideas of literary sensibilities literary cultures across literary cultures uh, across genres is very important so speaking for myself i mentioned the shikar stories and the the detective fiction pulp detective fiction no less that i saw my father reading uh, but as i mentioned my mother being a librarian uh, uh, introduced me to a whole bunch of things um when i was in fourth or fifth standard i had finished reading the children's classics so i finished almost all of the oliver twist and the a great many of the charles dickens and they came in those uh, macmillan and orion black swan orion longman uh, uh, series you know the children's classics of the dickens and other things i think my mother in her wisdom decided that i was becoming far too precocious and as was only reading serious stuff so she handed me mills and bones to read and there yeah. is video evidence of that i found a video on yes, youtube where you're me, showing off that collection my my collection of uh, my cherished collection of uh, uh, mills and bones millsies as they were mm-hmm. called so those who don't know mills and bones was a range of uh, light romantic pulp fiction and uh, very popular in india mills and boon was the publisher's name but the authors were different each time all in english so uh, my mother handed me very unusually for a, a, a mother she encouraged me to read this light romantic stuff so george it has and barbara cartlands and uh, and for a librarian especially so because she thought she need needed to wean me off this very serious stuff i was reading so i i i understood the benefit of of having light relief every now and then with the serious stuff i read uh i'd mentioned earlier i think to you that i we would go for our long summer vacations and spend large parts of our time in uh with my grandparents in aligarh there again i had access to a very very vast and varied very eclectic collection of books again in urdu and in english i remember reading my first albert camu the existentialist philosopher when i was in 8th standard 13 or 14 i must have been my mother gave me a copy of camu's exile as a birthday gift again a very unusual choice but i still remember uh the shop in connaught place where she bought it for and gave it to me with her signature i still have it from my grandfather's collection i was reading uh waiting for godo long before i read it as a master student in english i was reading uh, sartre as a as a very young person abba i called my grandfather my nana uh he had a very eclectic collection and so there were curry westerns in it those cowboy sort of books uh, those james hadley chase sort of stuff it even had some light pornographic stuff uh candy and other stories i remember um it had of course these existentialists and it had northrop fry which is like uh, uh, t s eliot uh, uh, and all these other the, the literary critics of the 60s and the 70s who i would later read when i was doing my masters in english but at that time i was just skimming through it to understand what is happening in the world of literary criticism so the point i'm trying to make here is that my own influences were very very diverse i was told that read 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 it doesn't matter really you know and i didn't have to hide those james hadley chases and those light pornographic stuff i could read it out in the open because if you can keep it in your collection then it's not taboo then you can't stop your grandchild from reading it because it's out there you see that was one thing an image that is imprinted in my mind is of my grandfather uh reading a lifafa an envelope made out of an old newspaper jisme ya to moongphali ya gazak ya amrood koi cheez aaye the turning it and reading it very closely with all the attention at his command reading it very closely the sanctity of the written word is what i have carried with me from having seen him here's a man who was a professor of urdu at aligarh a very well known poet a pro stylist and essayist he was given the padma bhushan award for his services to literature he had a collection of over 30000 books which after his death we donated to the national archives today there's a surur collection named after him in the national archives of india housing his entire collection here is a man with this vast and very rich collection of his own books at home reading that lifafa made out of old newspaper 
and reading it closely with great attention. Why? Because words have a sanctity. It doesn't matter that this is an old newspaper which has made that lefafa. What matters is that there is a written word. The other thing that I have always carried from me is the vast collection of dictionaries he had both in Urdu and in English and the many animated discussions we had on the meanings of words. Um, towards the end of his life, he would be sitting in an armchair and next to him there would be a stack of dictionaries. Not because he needed to consult them, but because he liked to consult them. And what he taught us, uh, my siblings and I, is that never be too embarrassed or ashamed to reach out to a dictionary if you think you're not sure of the meaning or you want to find out the root word of a meaning of a word. So the importance of dictionaries is something that is, again, imprinted in my brain. And this is something I like to tell uh, young people, especially to look out for. Invest in dictionaries. Don't think that the dictionary that is there in your word program on your laptop is sufficient. Have a physical dictionary handy because words, their meanings, their root words are all important. Also, Abba, my grandfather used to say that, you know, I don't understand this bored business. How do people get bored? If you have books to read, how can you get bored? And he said, if I'm marooned on an island and I have a dictionary with me, I will never get bored. And truly, that's something that I enjoy. When I have nothing else to do, I love to flip through a dictionary. Any random page, anywhere on M or A or P, I'll start looking at words and I'll find it so engrossing. So I think words have a sanctity, have contain great joy, contain multiple meanings. We just have to go looking for them. What a beautiful story about reading that Lifafa and dictionaries are actually also history books. Yes. And and it's it's kind of a tragedy of the modern times that no one is really going to just casually pick up a dictionary because there won't be a physical one lying next to them. You know, you can always do define colon whatever in yeah, Google yeah. and you'll it's get the there, meaning. It's there on your word program yeah, on your computer. But the serendipity of just opening to a page. And Absolutely. The great serendipitous joy of discovering uh, words and meanings and related words. So, when did you start to think of yourself as someone who would write? Right now, my WhatsApp status is, I write, therefore I am. <laughs> but I didn't reach this point. It's a tweak on, I think, therefore I am. But I don't think I reached this point. I don't think there was a moment of epiphany. I think I took a very long time to become a writer. For a long time, I was perfectly content being an editor. I worked in publishing companies. I moved to India International Center where I worked in the publications division, first as sub-editor, then as assistant editor of a magazine called the IIC Quarterly. I was perfectly happy editing other people's writing and had no ambition whatsoever to write. In fact, uh, I had zero ambition. I was not the person wanting to climb the top of the tree ever. I was just this willow the wisp, happy to drift with whatever. Uh, I mean, I was gainfully employed. I was not a burden uh, on society or my parents. So I was earning my keep, but I was not especially ambitious in terms of a career. I drifted from various jobs, uh, but at some point when I was at the India International Center, I had a boss who sent me off to watch a film and then she asked me to produce 400 words on it. And that was the first time I wrote something after after the tutorials and the essays that you're supposed to write in college. That was the first time I wrote a book review for our um, ISC newsletter. I still remember the film and what I wrote about it. And she read it and she said, she grunted and she said, fine, now we'll ask you to write more. So it started with that one film review. Which of, film was it? It was actually on Gertrude Stein, uh, whom I mentioned a short while ago, a rose is a rose is a rose. So there was a documentary on her being shown at the IIC and for the IIC newsletter, I had to write this 400 word piece. So life has been full of nice people and very serendipitous occurrences. That's how writing started with a 400 word review. Translations also happened like that. If I may share that story. Please, please. I had no thought in my head that one day I'm going to translate, even though I knew enough Urdu and Hindi uh, to read in those languages and write in those languages. 
I went for a routine meeting again when I was at the ISC to the Sahitya Academy, and I got talking to the editor of the Sahitya Academy's uh, journal called Indian Literature. This Dr. Rao, to whom I'm profoundly and endlessly grateful, if he's out there listening to this, um, sir, salam to you. Um, Dr. Rao opened his drawer, pulled out a a, a story, and uh, this was Mandir Masjid, a short story by Prem Chand. Uh, the copyright for Prem Chand had just opened up, and anybody could translate uh, Prem Chand. He said, "Mere paas ye kahani hai, aur mujhe kisi se translate karni hai. Aapko dekh ke lagta hai ki aapki Englishi to thik hi hai, Hindi Urdu aati hai." I said, "Haan, sir, aati hai. Dono aati hai." He says, "Why don't you translate it for me, and I'll publish it?" I said, "Sir, maine to kabi translate kia nahi hai." He says, "Kar ke dekh lije." So I took that story home, and on my father's battered old Remington, I typed out the translation, gave it to Dr. Rao. Dr. Rao published it, October nineteen ninety one, of uh, uh, the Indian Literature issue, and I was like a person who had tasted blood. Just go, kaise na khun mu ko lag gaya. I just. enjoyed that process of translating so much and because the copyright for prem chand had just opened i translated 13 short stories and the timing is all in serendipity that's how it happens uh in 92 uh india was just opening up to foreign publishers penguin had just started harper collins had just opened shop in india harper collins india and they were looking for books to publish and translation was still very new till then you had those jataka tales and other things in translation but indian literature in translation published by big companies was still very new you had your jaco and your smaller publishing companies but a harper collins or a penguin translating and publishing indian uh, translations from indian languages was very new so harper collins without any fuss or uh, any further ado instantly agreed to publish this In ninety two, my first book was published, which was Prem Chand's short stories that I had translated from Urdu into English, and it was called "The Temple and the Mosque and Other Stories." And like the writing of that four hundred word book, a film review, with this book, I found myself on a career uh, trajectory that I had not dreamt or planned. And today, here I am with my WhatsApp status thing. I write, therefore, I am. Beautiful, what a story! And let's talk a little bit about translation. I've had various translators on my show, from Aruna Vasena to Danish Hussain to Ranjit Hoskote. Danish and Ranjit were relatively recent. I had Sarah Rai. Uh, what a beautiful book she's written! What a beautiful book she's written! And in fact, that first essay, before, you know, the book wasn't out at the time we did our episode, so she read out a part of it at the start of the episode, and really just, uh, uh, you know, uh, lovely to be present there. And Let's talk a bit about translation because it seems to me that something that most people didn't get and I didn't get till I started thinking about it is that translation is basically an act of creation itself. That languages are fundamentally so different that it's not just the word ka meaning you know translate kar diya aur ho gaya. You have to get the essence of what the person is trying to say and then find a way to recreate that essence and recreate that vibe and that feeling. And it seems to me that this is particularly difficult between Urdu. Or Hindustani and English, because Urdu, Hindustani, that entire family is so expressive in many ways, so musical in certain ways, and English is just really different. The values of the language are so different. So tell me a little bit about those challenges and how you thought about those. Of course, there are many, many challenges, but um, I think translations generally serve a bridge between. Um, languages languages as disparate as let's say hindi urdu and english so think of languages as the banks of a river two banks not going to meet unless there is a bridge and that bridge is translation that's the purpose a uh, life would be uh, so much mehroom uh, to use an urdu word so bereft we as readers of world literature would be so bereft if we had not read the russian masters if we'd not read the latin american novelists if we'd not read the french symbolists i can go on all of these people have come to us you know uh, gorky and dostoevsky and maupassant and you know you 
can go on all the greek uh, the odyssey the iliad all of this homer we've read as in translation so imagine our world if we had not read this agar humne sirf apne hi ek island pe baith ke apni hi bhasha padhi hoti ya apne se milti julti bhasha padhi hoti to hum kitne hum mein kitni kamiyan reh jati pehli baat to ye translation un kamiyon ko dur karta hai Yes, there are losses, but the gains far outweigh the losses. The losses are inevitable. The losses are sharper and more significant in languages which are distinct and disparate. आप हिंदी से उर्दू में कर रहे हैं या उर्दू से हिंदी में कर रहे हैं तो शायद इतना लॉस ना होता हो बांग्ला से उड़िया में कर रहे हैं तो आई वुड इमेजन शायद इतना लॉस नहीं होता होगा कुछ लॉस तो जरूर होता होगा बट इतना नहीं होता होगा बट जहाँ लिटरी कल्चर्स जहाँ लिटरी सेंसिबिलिटीज इतनी फ़र्क हैं इतनी जुदा हैं वहाँ लॉस तो इनविटेबल होगा बट आप एटलीस्ट पीपल लाइक मी एंड इन आर लिटल फेलोशिप ऑफ ट्रांसलेटर्स वी ऑफन मीट वी ऑफन टॉक एंड इन आर ग्रुप वी ऑफन से दैट सम पीपल अग्री दैट यस देर आर लॉसेज अदर्स थिंक दैट नो वी शुडन बी थिंकिंग ऑफ द लॉसेज एट ऑल आई बिलोंग टू द स्कूल ऑफ थाट दैट सेज we have to go work on the assumption that loss is inevitable but we move with that humility of that uh, acknowledgement of the loss that is my position on translations and wo loss inevitable isliye hai ke uh, let me give you some examples in english there is one broad word aunt and uncle in hindi urdu in all our languages we have mama mami chacha chachi tau tai so on and so forth you know mother ke side ke alag terms hai father ke side ke alag term hai father ke elder brother ke liye alag word hai father ke chote brother ke liye alag word hai and it goes on english mein kya hai aunt aur uncle hai to meri generation se pehle wale jo gen- generation thi translators ki i don't want to take names because they were doing yeoman service they were pioneers but they also were working with many handicaps they were still saying aunt and uncle they were still saying cot for khatiya they were still saying um, unleavened flat bread for roti they were still saying clarified butter for ghee when my generation of people started translating from the early 90s we began to say what the hell i'm going to say ghee yaar figure it out I'm going to say roti. Surely everybody knows what roti is. Who doesn't? Let them figure it out. I'm not going to say uh, unleavened flat bread. I will not say it. We started from that position. We took small liberties. With time, we began to not take liberties, but we began to exercise greater control over. our material we began to show a little more confidence in our readers we began to say that listen when we as first year english honor students as 18 year old straight out of college read homer's odyssey nobody took us by the hand and took us into that world they just let us sink or swim when we first read about the wine dark seas that homer is describing i didn't know what a wine dark sea was but i used my imagination to figure it out yeah so we as 18 year olds were reading world literature in translation as first year undergrad students and we were loving it yes there were things we didn't understand but we found our way around it why do we want to make assume that our, our readers today the 21st century are idiots and they need bite sized information so let us retain as much as we can i am going to say khala jaan i will not say aunt at best i'll say khala jaan in a glossary and they can look up the glossary otherwise let them figure it out from the context that this is aunt now what kind of aunt material uh, mother side or father side the glossary will tell them so i began to do these little experiments another experiment i did and i thought i was doing it for the first time till my friend arunava sinha told me that the people have already done it with the latin americans may i share that experiment please, with you yes of course please everything um so i was translating this big novel by intezar hussain the pakistani chronicler of our times who died recently he was shortlisted for the man booker and so on he has written with great empathy about the partition about migration about building a new life and is i think a major urdu a uh, fiction writer of our times i had already translated many of his short stories but it was my first jab at translating his long novel 
I signed a contract with HarperCollins. The editor at HarperCollins had not read the novel. I myself chose to, decided to not read the novel. I thought this was an experiment that I was doing till Arunavas told me that others have also done it like this. I would only read as much of the translate of the original Urdu as I planned to translate on that particular day. So, man lijiye ke 150 pages ki agar novel hai, to wo maine pure 150 pages nahi padhe the. Agar on that particular day I was only able to translate a para, then I would only read that para as I was translating it and resist the impulse to read the next page or the next para and close the book and then when I picked it up again the next day I would read the rest of it. Now this was an amazing experience because what translation does is that it gives you a sense of power that I know this book. I'm taking away that power that I have as a translator and saying I'm no more and no less than a close reader. Yes, I'm reading it, but more closely than a casual reader because I have to translate it. So I have to know the exact meanings and the layers of meanings. But I will not know where this book is going. I will not know its end. So when I was translating the last paragraph, believe me, I really had goosebumps because the book that I had been with for so many months, that was the first time I was reaching its end and reading its end. So there are these little experiments you do to push the envelope, you know, to see what else you can do. Because, I mean, translation, what is translation after all? Clearly, we know what it is not. It is not an electronical exchange, uh, like a bank exchange, you know, from one bank account to another account. That it is not. It is not just a transfer of vocabulary and meaning from one language to another. It is not that. It is not merely also the transfer of one literary sensibility to another. It is many. Now we come to what it is. I think it is capturing a voice. It is capturing an ethos. It is capturing a sensibility. Now all this sounds vague. Let me give you examples. For people from the Indian subcontinent, the smell of rain on parched ground is very special. There's a word for it, sondhi, sondhi khushbu. And the English word is petrichore. Absolutely. But when you say petrichore, it sounds like something that grew in a petri dish. You don't want to use the word petrich. At least I don't want to use. When I translate Gulzar, who I have been, he uses the word sondhi very often. Not once was I tempted to use the word uh, petrichor. I think it's an awful, awful, non-poetic word. And also most English speakers won't know what it means. Uh, many English speakers won't even know it. I instead chose to go with damp fragrance. So I'll say moist fragrance. I know that petrichor is not moist. I know that sondha is not moist. But it's, it's a smell that comes with a sense of moisture laden in it there is that there is another word uh, sehra sehra is the word that is the veil of flowers made uh, to cover the face of both a bride and a groom now to an english speaker how do you say and now books that are published in india are available everywhere um, harper collins sends his books out penguin all of them you know so it's not we are no longer just writing for a specifically indian audience we know that yes our target audience is books here but these books will be picked up and will be read by anybody anywhere so if i say floral veil covering the groom's face a i make my sentence clumsy and awkward and very heavy and b i'm painting a bizarre word picture what is a groom with a floral veil? So I find it simpler to just say, use the word sehra. Hmm? And I leave it, I give the meaning in a glossary. If they feel that it's not immediately obvious what I'm referring to, they can look up because the sentence is like the tremulous uh, fragrance of the flowers from the sehra. So obviously it's referring to a scent that is coming from there. But I'm not giving its literal meaning. I'm using and retaining the word Sehra in it. Right? 
there are many many such instances uh, in intezar husain there is a reference to a kite with its string cut but uh, kati patang right there's a film also by that name kati patang is a metaphor it's a metaphor for drifting for aimless having lost its destination various things uh, of, of being slightly nostalgic of being who be gone it's a sad image now uh, when intezar husain uses the word kati patang his urdu readers know that this is a laden word he doesn't have to use too many other words but my english readers may or may not know what it means so what do i do i still say a kite with its string cut in my english but i provide a footnote now earlier we thought that translations don't need footnotes because this is not academic writing and only academic writing requires footnotes i'm saying that my job my brief as a translator is as much to provide a context as it is to do a literal translation so while i will say cut kite or kite with its string cut depending on the sentence i will give all of these extra layers of meaning in a footnote out of 10 maybe two three people will say listen when i'm reading a translation i don't want to be bothered with footnotes to those two three people i say skip over the footnote don't read it the remaining seven or eight might say that listen yes this helps me i get a context when intezar husain is referring to the early islamic history of cities like cordoba his urdu readers know what cordoba means you know that lost glory of islam but the english reader will not will be confounded ye cordoba ekdam se kahan se aa gaya what is cordoba why is he he was talking about buland shehar in western uttar pradesh and suddenly he's gone to cordoba what happened so i need to tell that english reader that when he's talking of cordoba the cat in cordoba he suddenly reminded of his mind is jumping going back in time to the lost glory of islam and i need to say this in a footnote i cannot lumber up that sentence which is there in the original that's not my brief my brief as a translator is to just translate that but increasingly in these 30 odd years of my journey as a translator the brief i've given to myself also is that my job is to provide a context so if you were to ask me how i look back at my journey and how, what are the losses and gains and what is the one lesson that i have as a translator or as a as a person drawn from this i would say that my journey has been from text to context i started out by concentrating just on the text and thinking this is my job today i look at the context also and i say yes my job is to translate the text as faithfully uh, with as much fidelity as i can but my job or my brief to use a legal term that i have given to myself nobody gave me that brief not the publisher not the reader not the book reviewer but a brief that i gave to myself is that i also want to well if not translate at least make accessible the context i think that gives an added layer to my reader that when he hears of the cat of cordoba suddenly springing up in buland shehar he needs to know where has this cat come from you know and we don't need to make translated texts exotic we don't need to glamorize them we don't need to make them alien and therefore you know different we need to retain all their peculiarities their whimsies their whimsicalities their absurdities their uniqueness we need to retain them as they are we can't improve them we can't gild that lily that lily is already gilded what we can do as translators is explain add another layer of meaning and uh, i have chosen to do them through footnotes and through long introductory essays now when i write uh, or translate even this collection of short stories which is my newest book urdu stories earlier i used to write a very modest one page two page translator's note now i call them introduction you see and i think my job is to write an introduction to write an 
a, a long essay giving the context of that text that i'm translating in fact your wonderful essay on the male gaze in urdu almost stands out as a separate you know uh, not just something that is uh, leading up to the book but as something beautiful and separate on its own i i I love that phrase text and co- text to context and it goes well with the metaphor of the bridge like you could argue that the language itself that you are using is like the road surface of the bridge but the foundations which make it f- firm and they make the bridge they're standing in the water yeah they're standing in the water and that's kind of the context you're giving and I'm really so so glad that you spoke about how you won't refer to roti as unleavened flatbread or whatever it was because that is such a pet peeve I have and I see it in novels coming out to this current day and I don't understand it because like when i grew up reading all the russian novelists like dostoevsky and tolstoy and all that nobody would translate samovar for me yeah. you know when i first read that word perhaps as an 8 year old i must have thought oh this must be the russian samosa and then you read a little bit more and you realize that no you realize what it is and i really like the approach of juno dias for example where i forget in which of his books but there's just a glossary at the end yeah. and the text is full of the authentic uh, uh, language that there is so the committed reader can go to the glossary but really a lot of the time you don't need to because you get a sense of yes, it from the yes. language itself that that's the beauty of the prose tell me a little bit about the processes that go into both translating and writing you've done tons of writing you've got a book of short stories you've got this wonderful uh, sort of a book of essays as well tell me about how they are different and tell me about how they those processes are because when you were speaking of that experiment you carried out where you're doing you know just you're read, you're just reading what you're doing that day you're immersing yourself in it finishing it moving on the next day it strikes me that the translating might also lead to this beautiful meditative process of discovering a kind of flow where you're just lost in it and it's just so beautiful for its own sake and as far as writing itself is concerned i imagine that i i think all writers that i know just don't find it easy it's really tough you need discipline you need to sort of really work out so much else it's not just about sitting down and inspiration strikes and you write it's so much hard work so tell me about these two processes and what they are like and what they mean for you Okay so I think yes it's hard work yes it's a lot of work but I think I'm blessed in so far as I can't remember a time when I've suffered from prolonged writer's block um maybe it is because I do different kinds of writings uh, had I been just a fiction writer I would have relied only on my imagination I have written some fiction yes I've written a collection of short stories called release and other stories that's been my one jab at fiction mostly I write non fiction but I do different kinds of writing so I think my mind doesn't get jaded or doesn't constantly need an external stimuli the text or whatever I happen to be working on is enough stimulus in itself. I will be writing an op-ed one day. The Indian Express or the somebody will call me up and say, "Listen, so and so has passed away. Ah, we need an obituary by the end of the day." So there, I will be writing an obituary, or I'll be writing an op-ed on something. It could be the hijab row in Karnataka. It could be the 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 thing that happened in Iran recently. You know, with that. Uh, so. it's different kinds of things so there's an op-ed one day there is a piece of translation one day there is a very political piece for the wire one day it is uh, my own uh, literary uh, you know uh, what i was trained to do is uh, to to work in literary histories in my 40s i decided and i must tell you for no particular reason to do a phd uh i was in a job i had a family a home to run children to raise all sorts of things and i took time out to write a phd on the progressive writers movement and that is a literary history so that is what i trained myself to work on today all these years after having finished the phd i continue to mine that subject i continue to go back to it and revisit it so i look at literary history which which essentially very very simply put means i look at the intersection of literature and history so let's say there is a real historical event such as for example the jallianwala bag or uh, the partition of india the creation of bangladesh the great bengal famine uh, the first world war these are all real historical events and i've turned them and use them as pegs for my books so i have a collection of essays on jallianwala bag or poetry and prose writings uh, responses to the first world war in urdu hindi punjabi whatever so i'm doing different kinds of things and therefore i think 
my stimulus is coming from the sheer variety of work I have. I've never had a time when I've had to sit at a desk and scratch my head and say, okay, I have a blank screen staring at me. Never, fortunately, had that uh, problem. Uh, in fact, I don't always even need a desk. I can write anywhere and I can write with interruptions. The doorbell is going, the courier person is there, the cook is asking me what is to be cooked. I'll tend to all of that and I'll pick up my sentence where I left it and go back to writing. Oh, that's a great uh, talent. Uh, yeah, well, that's a great uh, mercy. Yeah, so I don't understand writer's block at all. But again, I'm... If someone were to ask me why that is, I think it's because I do different kinds of writings. Maybe if it was just fiction I was doing or creative writing of some form, of, if I was a poet, maybe I would need that inspiration. Here, a lot of my work is just plain and simple hard work. You know, it's it's grunt work many times. So, and it requires, it takes, it demands different things from you. A translation will require a very close reading of a text, of somebody else's text that you are working on. Uh, the footnotes and the other things are your own part, your inputs to it, but essentially it's somebody else's text. Literary criticism will require your inputs again of a text, but not in a way that a translation requires. The demands are totally different. An op-ed, uh, which is a political, political piece, will require your understanding of what you've read or which has happened around you again not as a knee-jerk response it's not that there is a hijab row happening in karnataka and you write a piece that also requires some background reading you look up a judgment you look up a news report so there's a fair amount of uh, cross-referencing you do there's a fair amount of uh, research you do there's a fair amount of back background reading you do so I've learned over the years that different kinds of writings, in my case, the different kinds of writings I do make different demands of me. And I think I'm throwing up many balls in the air and I'm catching different balls at different times. And I think that keeps me my mind occupied and that keeps me occupied in a way that I have fortunately not reached a saturation point and I cannot say that I'm bored. I cannot ever say that I get up in the morning and say, oh gosh, I hate my life. I fortunately have not reached that point because there's so much variety in what I read, which goes into my writing and what I write. Beautiful. My next question is about Urdu. But before that, you mentioned the lovely word Mehroom a while ago. And um, uh, I, I'll link to the song by my friend Raman Negi, which was called Mehroom, which was actually recorded in this very room you wow. and I are sitting in. So nice. that is some coincidence there. So, you know, in your book at one point, you write the following words about Amir Khusro, who of course lived in the 13th century. And you write, according to a popular anecdote, Amir Khusro was given a set of four unrelated words, Kutta, Khir, Thol and Charkha and challenged to string them together. From these everyday prosaic words, he produced the following four-lined words verse. Khir pakai jatan se charkha diya jalai, aya kutta kha gaya tu bethi dhol bajai. Which you've translated as I took pains to cook khir, even burned the wooden wheel, a dog came and ate it up while you sat playing the drum stop coat. And uh, what I loved about this and what struck me about this is these are 13th century words. It is A, he's using delightfully simple language and he's using delightfully simple language that I sitting today can be moved by and can 700 appreciate years later. 700 years later, which tells you about what a remarkable living language this is. Equally, there is another trend that I see and I ask Danish about this also because in the context of his doing all the Dasangoi stuff that he does. Equally, I will often find that while reciting a piece of words, the language will sometimes be so difficult that the poet or the, das, the Dasangoi or you know whoever is reciting it will actually explain individual words while doing it. And I get it because all those words are remarkably beautiful. They condense a lot of meaning in you know, uh, just a syllable or two. But at the same time, uh, there is a danger that it can become inaccessible. And you see these sort of these different directions that on the one hand, it's a beautiful, joyful, living language, which um, 
um, uh, you know can speak to so many of us and on the other hand there is almost this high literary tradition which takes you to a place you can't otherwise go yes but that does affect uh, sort of the accessibility of it and so on and so forth and and i don't know if it's related in any way but you once uh, mentioned in one of your essays that after partition the urdu short story writers thrive but the urdu poets didn't quite quite thrive so much and i wonder if that's related so uh, I don't want to necessarily ask a question on these specific aspects of the language, but I want to kind of understand the evolution of Urdu and whether it is in danger. Because as you alluded to earlier, it has also been a target of politics where quite bizarrely Hindustani or whatever you call it was you know, sought to be divided into Urdu, which is for the Muslims, and some Shud Hindi, which is for the, the others, and who don't, nobody even speaks Shud Hindi. So, g- give me a sense of how Urdu has evolved, uh, you know, through all these years. And uh, right. as we speak today, this evening, or is it tomorrow? I'm getting confused. Maybe tomorrow. There is a very interesting uh, talk being given by Javed Akhtar here in Delhi at the India International Center. It is called. Urdu and Hindi, the Siamese twins. And he's talking to Alok Rai, who's written That's a great right. book, he's Hindi National. He's talking to Alok Rai, yes. Uh, I'm looking forward to that conversation very much. I think these uh, divides, which are uh, not new, um, the Urdu-Hindi dispute goes back to over 100 years, with champions of both languages turning the literary scene into an akhara, and the Urdu walas and the Hindi walas have been turned into wrestlers in a pit with each p- party saying we are stronger. And so I think instead of a wrestling pit, had it become a kinder, gentler space, more accommodating of each other, more where both would benefit from each other, where both come from common stock, where both, as uh, Javed Akhtar's title of the talk suggests, Siamese twins, uh, if not Siamese twins, I like to use another expression. I like to say that uh, they're born from the same mother. They are siblings born from the same mother. So yes, they have common commonalities and they have differences. Uh, I don't think we need to go looking for commonalities, differences. We need to cherish both languages and go for what works with us instead of making it pure, should. I'm confounded completely by the amount of energy that the mongers of hate and uh, divisiveness and otherness choose to expend on, on, on weeding out. For example, there is a campaign underfoot right now, these days. A very, it has been there, but is gaining momentum of weeding out Urdu words from all police work and judicial work and wow. replacing them with Hindi ones. Now, for a very long time, Urdu words like Vakalat Nama or so many of them, I mean, they have been part of the the vocabulary of the, whether it's the beat constable or the SHO or the whatever, as you go up the ladder of the police uh, force. Similarly, in the judicial uh, judiciary, be it the lower courts or up till the high court, there are words that have been part of the nomenclature, the usage and so on. Now, to link it to hypernationalism of a certain kind, the jingoistic hypernationalism that we were earlier talking about, to link it to that and to say the use of Urdu in uh, judicial work or police work is somehow anti national is, to my mind, absurd. To replace it either with inaccurate or difficult to comprehend new words is just excessive. This energy can be put to better use. There are very many ways than all this zeal can be put to. So why do you want to reinvent the wheel and put all your energy in that? And what harm is a word like vakalat nama or uh, all of these words doing to you in real words? This kind of, what shall I say, pouring of hatred the fact that it's spilling over and affecting languages and literatures is to nobody's good, you know. So I would much rather that we focus on communication. If a certain word has come into currency and it is accessible and understandable, we focus on that. Earlier on in the conversation, I referred to the great role of the Hindi films, Hindi cinema from coming out of Mumbai that has taken 
اردو ہندی اینڈ ٹیکن اٹ ٹو دا نوکس اینڈ کرانیز آف دا پاپولر امیجنیشن اب وہ پنواڑی کی دکان چاہے وہ مدراس میں ہے چاہے وہ کشمیر میں ہے لداخ میں ہے اروناچل پردیش میں ہے اگر وہاں گانا بج رہا ہے تو وہاں پہ رہنے والے لوگ چائے کی دکان کے پان کی دکان کے وہ گانا سن رہے ہیں اینڈ ہندی فلم لرکس لرسز بیٹ ساحر اور گلزار اور جاوید اختر ہیو ڈن امیزنگ ورڈس ون دیٹ آئی کین تھنک فرام دا ٹاپ مائی ہیڈ ایک سانگ ہوتا تھا گویا کے چنانچے اب یہ ایک بڑا ایڈیومیٹک اردو کا ایکسپریشن ہے آپ نے اس کو ایک ہندی سانگ میں ڈال دیا تو جس کو نہیں بھی پتا اس کو ایک نیا لفظ سیکھ رہا ہے ڈز نالج ڈو یو ہارم اف یو لرن اے نیو ورڈ گم شدہ یہ بھی ایک گانے میں یوز ہوتا ہے ایز اے ریفرین مے بی یو ڈنٹ نو وٹ گم شدہ مینس یو نو گم بٹ یو نو شدہ سو بٹ یو فگر آؤٹ وٹ گم شدہ مینس فرام دا سانگ اف یو لرننگ اے نیو ورڈ ڈز اٹ ڈو یو ہارم ڈز اٹ ٹیک اوے فرام دا ایگزسٹنگ اسٹاک آف ورڈس یو نو ان ادر لینگویجز سو دس دس دا تھنکنگ بہائنڈ دس کائنڈ آف ویڈنگ آؤٹ آف سینگ ڈونٹ یوز دیز ورڈس is it coming from a place of inferiority is it coming from a place saying that no this is going to make my language poorer what explanation is 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 it for for this kind of thinking i think a uh, cinema hindi cinema has done amazing work to keep certain words relevant to, to keep certain words in currency As recently as Student of the Year, which features very young people, then a very young Alia Bhatt and so on, there was a song about Gori and Panghat and so on. Now, when was the last time a city-bred child saw a go- Gori going to a Panghat? But songs have managed to keep certain words in currency. Kya ye buri baat hai? Isse kya nuksaan hota hai? Isse aap aur mein kya gharib ho jate hai? اس سے بارہ تیرہ چودہ سال کا بچہ جو گوری اور پنگھٹ کا ذکر سن رہا ہے جس نے نہ گوری دیکھ کی سمجھ ہے نہ پنگھٹ کی سمجھ ہے آر دے پور اور وائٹ آئی ڈونٹ تھنک سو سو آپ اس کو کانٹیکس میں دیکھیے آپ یہ سمجھیے کہ اس سے آپ کا نقصان کیا ہو رہا ہے آپ کیوں بلائنڈلی خلاف ہیں کسی چیز کے کیونکہ آپ سے کسی نے کہا کیونکہ آپ سے ایک واٹس ایپ فارورڈ آیا یا آپ کی نیبرہڈ شاخہ والے آدمی نے آپ سے کہا کہ یہ شبد کا پریوگ کرو گے تو تم پہ خود نقصان ہوگا کیا نقصان ہوگا وائی ڈونٹ یو تھنک فور یور سیلف اینڈ سی ایک اور زبان آنے سے کیا آپ کا نقصان ہوتا ہے آپ کو یاد ہوگا جب سیٹلائٹ اسپیس میں گئی تھی تو مسز دکشت نے انڈین ایسٹرونٹ سے پوچھا تھا ہم میں سے وہ لوگ جو اس جنریشن کے ہیں جنہوں نے دور درشن پہ یہ دیکھا تھا یہ کلپ ہمارے ذہن میں ہے ابھی بھی مسز اندرا گاندھی ان ہر ٹنی وائس از آسکنگ وہاں سے بھارت کیسا لگتا ہے اینڈ پیٹ کمز دا رپلائی سارے جہاں سے اچھا ہندوستاں ہمارا کیا یہ اس میں کوئی حرچ ہے What is سارے جہاں سے اچھا ہندوستان ہمارا اٹس اے فریگمنٹ آف اے شیر آف اے ورس ریٹن بائی محمد اقبال دی اردو پوائٹ ناؤ ٹوڈے اٹس فیشنیبل ٹو ڈس اقبال پیلی بھیت کے ایک اسکول میں ایک اسکول اسمبلی میں اقبال کی ایک دعا بچوں نے پڑھ دی اس پرنسپل پہ اور اس ٹیچر پہ جس نے وہ اسمبلی کنڈکٹ کرائی تھی ایف آئی آر درج ہو گیا کہ آپ نے فادر آف دا ٹو نیشن تھیوری کو پروپاؤنڈ کرنے والے کی پوئم کیسے پڑھوا دی از دس ہاؤ فار وی ہیو کم اقبال برے ان کی لکھی ہوئی ہر چیز بری لیکن جب انڈین ایسٹرناٹ وہاں سے کہتا ہے سارے جہاں سے اچھا ہم سب کی چھاتی چوڑی ہو گئی ہم سب کو گرو محسوس ہوا ہم سب کو خوشی ہوئی اینڈ آئی ڈاؤٹ اف اٹ واز اے ریہرس تھنگ اور ایون اف اٹ واز اے ریہرس تھنگ اٹ واز سو اپروپریٹ فار دیٹ انسٹنٹ فار دیٹ موقع وہاں سے آپ کو بھارت کیسا لگتا ہے سارے جہاں سے اچھا ہندوستان ہمارا آئی تھنک از بیوٹیفل سو اف پوئٹری اور ورس ان اینی لینگویج کنڈ میں تامل میں اردو میں ہندی میں اگر پوئٹری میں یہ شکتی ہے یہ ابلٹی ہے کہ وہ آپ کو گاگر میں ساگر بھر دے اٹ کین سے الاٹ ان اے فیو ورڈس اب وہ کس بھاشا میں ہے آپ کو اس سے بھی اعتراض ہے تو میرے خیال سے آپ کی سوچ میں کہیں کوئی غلطی ہے you know you and i in protest should form a heavy metal band called wakalat nama ah. and our first album should be called gumshuda gumshuda we will show them the yeah. personalist political all right can you play any instruments 
Unfortunately, I can't. I'm tone deaf. I can't play an instrument. I can't sing to save my life. Oh my God! There goes the plan. I have decided to learn an instrument this year, so I'm announcing it on the show. Let us see if at the I'm end of sure 2024, I'm going to be a great I'm success. Managed. I wish you all the best. But you know, I asked you about Urdu literature, and uh, we uh, sort of took this digression into Urdu Hindi politics. So I will come back to Urdu literature because I will not let you get away with a subject that you know you wrote a book about your PhD thesis, of course, uh, uh, the progressive writers. And what strikes me when I hear what you say about them and I read what you've written about them is that. like one it was a really diverse group of writers who were writing in urdu hindi and eventually so many other languages uh, and 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 two that there was a sense of this common cause this that everybody gathered around you know there was this sense of mission the sense of excitement um, you know what premchand says in 36 where he says we must redefine what is beautiful the meaning of the word and all of that you know the way it comes together in london of all places you know sajad zahir and you know the majlis there so tell me a little bit about uh you know how this movement came about um what is that common cause that they all embraced what was the relationship to authority and you know everything that you were saying about cinema really also comes out of here isn't it that it's really these progressive writers who go to bollywood in the 40s and 50s and they are writing these beautiful lyrics and these films and all of that and we can talk more about that as well but just tell me about this whole uh, progressive writers movement which is inspiring for various reasons because we don't have anything like that like forget the particular cause i don't see people gathering around any cause today everyone is atomized and uh, you know peering inside first of all let me congratulate you on your amazing research in my work and the extent and the detail with which you have gone into uh, the various things i've written i'm most impressed and the fact that you can quote from premchand's uh, the inaugural address to the pwa but if you if you will permit uh, let me first say Uh, explain a little about what the progressive writers movement and the progressive writers association was for those of your readers listeners who may not have heard of it so um you know the seeds of progressive writing go back to my mind to the 1857 the first uh, what we now historians call the first war of independence uh, there was a burst of political energy that came out of the events of 1857 the mutiny or ghadar or first war of independence whatever you want to call it and literature not just urdu literature but literatures of uh, india at least upper india let's say because those are the literatures i've i've read and studied um I only have a sense of what was happening in Marathi, in Kannada, in Tamil, and Telugu, and other literatures. But my sense is that the literatures of Upper India were greatly affected by the uh, by 1857, and this energy, this political energy that comes out uh, post 1857, changes. literature so if till that point literature was about escapist fantasies it was about fa- afsanas and dastans and you know escapades into worlds of the imagination if the ghazal was all about beauty and romance and so on we see changes very dramatic noticeable changes post 1857 even the ghazal which is an amatory ode which is still using even today it continues to use uh, a certain kind of vocabulary but camouflaged and hidden in that time honored vocabulary are new concerns there's more agency to use a modern word uh, the but the sanam the kafir which are age old uh, metaphors in urdu poetry post 1857 began to be used for the foreign power so but sanam kafir was not just the beloved or the opponent in love but it became uh, began to be used for the colonial powers for the english powers who are uh, the oppressors so we see a change in while using the same vocabulary we see the intended targets changing we see greater political consciousness we see it in po- uh, in poetry and prose which is still finding its feet uh, by the turn of the century we have didactic novels being written by hali and others we see greater social consciousness by the time of premchand we see uh, a very socially engaged socially purposive literature premchand is already writing before the progressive writers movement comes around so we have novels like godan nirmala we have a talk of social justice we have talk of exploitation we have talk of the dalits who are at that point being called gandhi is calling them untouchables so we have 
a writer like Premchand talking about the poorest of the poor, the most marginalized. We're talking about the differences between rich and poor. We're talking of a variety of social evils, you know, Thakur ka kua, that kind of stories being written. We also know that Premchand is influenced by the uh, the social realism of the Russian writers because literature is being made available to us in translation. A lot of Russian literature, world literature is coming to us in translation through English, through Hindi, through Urdu and so on. All this is happening. All this is happening at a slow and steady pace. This is, uh, it's not dramatic. It's not overnight. It is not as though the Russian revolution impl brings a certain communist ideology and plants it into Indian soil and this dramatic flowering happening of socialist or communist thought. I don't see it like that. I see it as a lot of things happening in Indian soil caused by circumstances and situations in India. Yes, influenced to some extent by texts and translations coming from Soviet Union, bringing the ideas of socialism, of communism, of egalitarianism and the idea of change that if the Russian Revolution, the October Revolution can happen there, then post-1919, the Indian masses are also beginning to be made conscious of the fact that if it can happen there, it can happen here. If the peasants can rise up in revolt against their czar, it can happen here. And it's not just the Russian Revolution. Ideas are coming from Europe, from America, from all over. In 1932, something very remarkable happens. A book comes out in December 1932 called Angari. It's the first of its kind anthology written by four young people. Uh, Comrade Mahmood Zafar, Dr. Rashid Jahan, a woman, uh, Sajad Zaheer and Ahmed Ali. Angari is considered blasphemous, sacrilegious and within two, three months it is banned. By March 1933 it is banned. And uh, the colonial government is uh, is convinced by uh, by by by. Indians themselves that you know a book like this should never be published because it is uh, it is against religion it's against morality it's against society but Angare as its name suggests meaning flaming embers contains embers of a change uh, many of these young people, the four names that I mentioned, uh, of whom the most prominent is Sajad Zahir, who goes away to London, and with a group of other fellow young people, including Mulk Rajanand and others, uh, draws up a manifesto of what he calls the, of all of them, called the Progressive Writers Association. He comes back to India and in April 1934, the first of its kind literary gathering happens in Lucknow in a hall called Rifai Arm Hall. This is called the Progressive Writers uh, Meeting and this is the first All India Progressive Writers Meeting. Prem Chand, who is going to die a few months later in that year, he comes and he addresses the inaugural meeting. Aapne jiska zikr kiya, that is part of his very famous inaugural speech. He comes and he says that hame khubsurti ka mayar badalna hoga. We will have to change the, we meaning the writer's community, will have to change the standard of beauty, the definition of beauty. All this while we have thought beauty lies in a moon-like maiden with, uh, you know, almond eyes and long hair and milky white complexion. No, beauty is also in the sweat on the forehead of the woman who is working in the field and nursing her baby and then goes back to tilling that field. She too can be the fit subject of literature. So he's addressing and he's a man of great respect at that point. His novels, his stories are read widely. And at this first All India Progressive Writers Association, which is attended by writers who come as delegates, which is all very new and unusual. So, chie ke nain ke paas paise hain, na funds hain, na koi institutional support hai. But this group of young writers led by Sajad Zaheer, Saj uh, there's Rashid Jahan, there are a whole lot of other young people who are part of this fledgling movement. They just shoot off postcards to people. Prem Chand ko bhi aise letter bhejte hain, Maulana Hasrat Mohani ko bhejte hain, Abdul Haq ko bhejte hain, Sarojini Naidu ko chithi lik dete hain. And jo log aa sakte hain, wo apne expense pe aate hain, is uh, uh, meeting ko attend karte hain, jo nahi aa paate hain, wo ek apna solidarity or support ka letter bhejte hain. Rabindana Tagore ek letter bhejte hain. To is tarah se a great movement comes together. 
very organically with no great expense no with no great as it were planning there is a manifesto yes that is read and passed at this first meeting briefly us manifesto mein ye hai ki let us not look at the past if we are nostalgic we will be regressive because we will go back instead let us be progressive let us look forward main aapko bahut simplistic terms mein bata rahi hu i am i'm using uh, um, you know trying to give a very sort of uh, distilled essence of that manifesto but essentially what the progressive writers movement and the progressive writers association is is doing is it's saying let literature hold up a mirror to society and in that mirror you should see you should be able to see the good the bad the ugly whatever is in your samaj jo aapke samaj mein hai wo aapki literature mein dikhna chahiye samaj mein agar unevenness hai jhol hai exploitation hai weakness hai corruption hai achhai hai burai hai वो सब आपकी लिटरेचर में दिखना चाहिए प्रेमचंद ये काम ऑलरेडी कर रहे थे प्रेमचंद और उनके जैसे और लेखक ये काम ऑलरेडी कर रहे थे बट मूवमेंट से एसोसिएशन से वो एक पुख्ता हो जाता है वो स्ट्रेंदन हो जाता है उसको एक एक डायरेक्शन मिल जाता है and then all the delegates who've come from different parts of the country and we know that there are delegates uh, who are writers from marathi who tamil telugu odia bangla hindi urdu it must be said that the great many of the writers in the early days of the progressive writers movement are urdu writers why because urdu is pretty much the lingua franca in the 30s at that time uh, urdu is spoken both north and south of the vindhyas in dakkan and other places urdu is even gujarat urdu is spoken written read so yes the great many uh, the engines who are driving this uh, the, the this 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 movement are urdu writers which is not to say that they are only urdu writers they are hindi writers bangla marathi and soon Uh, branches begin to sprout all over india progressive writers movement has branches in different states and different writers gujarat mein bahut active hai bombay ka jo pwa hai wo bahut active hai there are linkages with the communist party of india we should not shy away from admitting it but it is not a front of the communist party yes there are linkages yes there are many people who are communists who are members of the pwa but you can also say that there are many people who are part of the film industry who are members of the pwa who are also communists so see it as circles circles with overlap so you have people working in the film industry like prem dhawan and others like sahir like uh, majru like kafi azmi like ali sardar jafri they could be working as lyricists like as story writers as dialogue writers in some cases even technicians people who have left of center sympathy you, they are people uh, members of the progressive writers movement and they are also members of another movement that from the 40s becomes very powerful which is the ipta indian people theater association ye ek waqt hai jab you don't have to be either or it's not ki aap pwa ke member hain to aap ipta ke nahi ho sakte aap pwa ke member hain to aap kisi aur cheez ke member nahi ho sakte there is a loose fellowship there is a loose sense of you know belonging kuch log full timers hain party ke members hain wo फिल्म में भी काम करते हैं वो राइटिंग भी करते हैं वो पोइट्स भी हैं कुछ लोग हैं जिनको मैं कहती हूँ फेलो ट्रैवलर्स इन द सेंस के वो साथ तो चल रहे हैं लेकिन वो कम्युनिस्ट या सोशलिस्ट नहीं हैं उनकी हो सकता है सेंसिबिलिटी लेफ्ट ऑफ सेंटर है बट जरूरी नहीं है कि वो पार्टी होल टाइमर्स हैं या उन्होंने पार्टी टैक्स पढ़े हैं या उन्होंने कम्युनिस्ट टोम्स एंड टैक्स पढ़े हैं या उनकी एक बहुत नुआंस्ड अंडरस्टैंडिंग है कम्युनिज्म या सोशलिज्म के बारे में लेकिन वो ये मानते हैं कि समाज में जस्टिस की जरूरत है वो ये मानते हैं कि समाज में जो दूरियां हैं उनको पाटने की ज़रूरत है वो ये मानते हैं कि इनक्वालिटी को कम से कम करने की ज़रूरत है वो ये मानते हैं कि मैं भले ही वर्कर नहीं हूँ खुद भले ही मैं फार्मर नहीं हूँ खुद लेकिन मुझे कॉमन कॉज करना चाहिए मैं भले ही औरत नहीं नहीं हूँ लेकिन मैं औरतों की बात करना चाहता हूँ और ये बहुत बड़ी बात है दिस इज़ द फर्स्ट टाइम एटलीस्ट इन in recorded literary history at least in india where a bunch of people are saying speaking of the other men think it's okay to speak about i mean premchand has already been writing novels like nirmala and others where he's talked uh, with great empathy of 
अबाउट वेमेन अबाउट वेमेंस लाइफ अबाउट यंग वेमेन बींग मैरिड ऑफ टू ओल्ड मैन तो ये सब हो रहा है बट प्रोग्रेसिव राइटर्स कहते हैं कि हमें बहुत क्लोजली देखना है हमसे लेस फॉर्चुनेट लोगों के साथ क्या हो रहा है we to use a modern expression have to find common cause with a whole bunch of isms it could be feminism it could be anti imperialism anti colonialism anti fascism remember that fascism is on the rise in europe the first world war has already gotten over the second world war is brewing so in the 30s and the early 40s when the progressive writers movement is taking shape in india fascist forces are rising in europe and the indian writers are not blind and unaware of that they are very conscious of what damage fascism can do and the forces that are strengthening so they are cautioning indian readers indian uh, uh, writers that this is happening elsewhere let's be watchful let's be mindful so they are making common cause with all of these isms and then they are adding a lot of things that are peculiar to india for example they are talking of zamindari abolition premchand has already talked about the lifestyle of the zamindars and how there is a disconnect between the zamindar and the worker and the you know farm worker so we've already had writers cautioning us about agrarian unrest about the caste system and gandhi ji has come back to india by now gandhi ji is talking about untouchables gandhi ji is talking about social justice all of this is getting picked up and amplified by the writers of the pwa the progressive writers association in all the bhashas because my work is largely in urdu and in hindi Uh, my frame of reference comes back to being urdu and hindi but i know that this is happening in marathi in telugu and uh, tamil and in bangla in odia in assamia it's happening in all of the bhashas the progressive writers some who are formally part of the pwa some ha organically wo zameen se uth ke aaye hain lekin unke concerns wohi hain भले ही उन्होंने पी का नाम नहीं सुना है भले ही वो बॉम्बे नहीं गए हैं पी में क्या हो रहा है भले ही उन्होंने इनागरल एड्रेस लखनऊ में नहीं सुना है प्रेमचंद का बट इन अ वेरी ऑर्गेनिक वेरी नेटिव वे टू यूज़ अ वर्ड व्हिच इज़ लोडेड इन अ वेरी नेटिव सेंस दे हैव an idea that this is happening and we need to speak up about this so the progressive writers movement is both the organized part and the unorganized part which is the fellow travelers or those who've gleaned this understanding of change of of a new kind of literature that needs to be written on their own कुछ वो फोक से भी आया है फोक में भी तो यही सब बातें होती हैं आज से नहीं सालों से हो रही हैं कई सौ साल से फोक फोक सॉन्ग्स फोक लोक कथाएँ आपको सही और गलत बड़ा और छोटा अमीर और गरीब का फ़र्क बताती आई हैं यू नो जातक कथा में भी यही बातें हुई हैं तो ये चीज़ें हमारे पास हैं ये हमारी धरोहर का हिस्सा है द पी डब्ल्यू ए इज़ गिविंग फॉर्म एंड शेप टू अ लॉर्ड ऑफ कंसर्नस that are around us that are brewing that have been brewing for centuries around us the only difference is that here is a movement the first of its kind that brings so many people together why because essentially there is nothing in that movement that any right thinking person can disagree with kaun kahega ke feminism galat hai kaun kahega ke zamindari ko nahi abolish karna chahiye kaun kahega ke hum nationalism ki baat nahi karenge kaun kahega ke hum anti imperialism ke khilaf awaaz nahi uthayenge to in the early days उसमें कमियां हैं हम उस पर भी बात कर सकते हैं आगे चल के उसमें कुछ शॉर्टकमिंग्स हैं उसमें कुछ रिजिडिटीज हैं जो आगे चल के क्रिस्टलाइज हो जाती हैं वी कैन टॉक ऑफ दोज बट इन द अर्ली डेज व्हेन दिस इज अ ब्राइट ग्लीमिंग शाइनिंग न्यू मूवमेंट इट इज फुल ऑफ गुड पीपल विद गुड आइडियाज विद गुड इंटेंशन एंड दर इज एंड वाई डज इट बिकम सो पैन इंडियन वाई डज इट बिकम सच एन पैन इंडियन थिंग वाई डज इट बिकम सो Uh, why does it spread so quickly because there is something for everybody in it for women for men for old for young for the marginalized there is something that everybody can get out of this it is touching the lives of everybody 
you know and i think that is the reason for its sudden mass appeal why it spreads from the 30s to the 40s it's like a raging fire that is spread across um across india and the film lyricist about whom we keep mentioning both you and i are mindful of the impact they have had on our popular culture and our popular consciousness many of the film lyricists are picking up and amplifying these progressive ideas through their songs you know this is the the cinema of the 40s and the 50s is talking of progressive ideas so at this point i must tell my listeners that you know you mentioned rashid jahan one of the writers of angare you've written a great book on her called a rebel and her cause the life and work of rashid jahan so uh, you know that is one more book that my listeners can pick up right away yes please and do go out please and buy do. it it's a it's a book written with a lot of love i just adored that book yeah so everyone must buy that here's my next question i feel that artists everywhere face this dilemma that how much do you turn your gaze inwards how much do you turn it outwards for example in kashika si kashinath singh has this memorable line that i often quote and i'll give the family friendly version of it on the show bhar mein jaye duniya hum bajaye harmonia right so where and and that's kind of one way of looking at it but what is apparent with the progressive writers movement is this common cause not just across social classes and caste and gender and all of that but even across nations like something happens far away like you mentioned in 1961 petris lumumba dies yes and uh, fez writes about him sahir uh, writes about him in fact i'll quote these english lines from sahir after translation for my listeners and maybe you can share fez as urdu as well but sahir writes tyranny has no caste no community no status no dignity tyranny is simply tyranny from its beginning to its end blood however is blood it becomes a hundred things shapes that cannot be obliterated flames that can never be extinguished chants that can never be suppressed stop quote and again sort of speaking of the universality of the human experience that it doesn't matter if something happens somewhere else to someone else it kind of concerns all of us and how how does one think of sort of the balance between these two because a danger in uh, this sort of approach is that it can shade towards activism which can actually dilute the art itself you know milan kundera famously warned against you know if you bring too much politics into art it becomes activism and and doesn't remain art and uh, now all of these people did so much great work that is art and that is at the same time speaking of the world and speaking of the human condition so what do you feel about this particular uh, sort of the difficulty of maintaining this particular balance and why did that why do why did that movement dissipate why did it kind of fade away you're actually asking me a bunch of uh, very uh, complex questions I'm i so hope sorry for no, no 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 I, no 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 they are complex they are interesting and they deserve long answers i want, i'm not sure i'll be able to do justice to all of them i'll see how many i can remember the one was about cosmopolitanism um i think the progressives greatest contribution was that they were not insular yes they were talking about purely indian things but they were also willing to look outside of india uh, the common cause that we are referring to is not just about what is happening within the borders of this country so it is not just the telangana movement or the uh, the naval mutiny of the coast of uh, mumbai or you know things like that they are talking of those things also but they're also talking about asia and africa the awakening that is happening in asia and africa with independence of india we see a similar awakening in other parts of the world we, the people in other countries which are either colonized or which are enslaved in some form or the other they are saying let's throw off the the yoke of tyranny the way india has done it so so many it's like a domino effect in different parts of asia and different parts of africa uh, country after country is standing up and saying we want to be sovereign uh you mentioned uh, patrice lumumba the first democratically elected uh, president of uh, congo who is uh, who's assassinated now this happens in 1961 and you might say that you know we've got enough on our hands there's so much happening in india we've just had one war we're preparing for the next war how does it matter to us if some small country in africa the president is is, is assassinated but no the indian progressives are writing in white heat they are saying that listen this is the murder of democracy 
and this is what i like and remember that by the 60s the progressive writers movement is not even as strong as it is during its high noon of the uh, uh, mid to late 40s it is a weakened force but even so even though it is weakened even though it has a lot on its plate it has many things nibbling away at its skirts and weakening it uh, we'll come to those forces also in a bit but even so we have writers uh, like sahir like faiz like uh, maktoum mohyuddin the wonderful poet from hyderabad using this instance of the uh, assassination of patrice lumumba and writing about it the sheer that you quoted in urdu i think uh, it is as follows uh, it says zulm phir zulm hai badhta hai to mit jata hai zulm phir zulm hai badhta hai to mit jata hai khoon aakhir khoon hai tapkega to jam jayega ab isme patris lumumba ka koi zikr nahi hai congo ka koi zikr nahi hai africa ka koi zikr nahi hai lekin jagah aapko context pata hai main bar bar context ki taraf aati hu because context often defines a text ये लिखा गया है उस वक्त में ऐसे ही मजरू सुल्तान सॉरी मखदूम महुद्दीन भी हैदराबाद के एक शेर लिखते हैं फैज भी लिखते हैं तो वॉट इज हैपनिंग इन डिफरेंट पार्ट्स ऑफ द वर्ल्ड इज अफेक्टिंग फैज रोड दैट ब्यूटिफुल नजम अबाउट दोजनबर्ग ट्रायल इन अमेरिका ना यू माइट थिंक दैट विद सो मच हैपनिंग इन पाकिस्तान वाई इज ए बॉर्डर्ड अबाउट द रोजनबर्ग ट्रायल इन डिस्टेंट अमेरिका हम जो तारीख हम जो तारीख राहों में मारे गए एंड देन इट गोज ऑन सो दोज ऑफ आस हुर किल्ड ऑन दिस डार्क पास दैट वी सेट आउट ऑन इट्स अबाउट द मर्ड द द किलिंग ऑफ द रोजनबर्ग कपल एंड इट्स अबाउट द विच हंट ऑफ द कम्युनिस्ट दैट इज हैपनिंग इन 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 अमेरिका सो द द पॉइंट हियर इज दैट वी हैव अ लिटरी मूवमेंट दैट इज शोइंग द वे टू टेल पीपल टू नॉट बी इन सेलर I am reminded of a conversation I had with Shashi Tharoor about his uh, last book. I was doing a Q and A with him, and he said that parent, his parents' generation, was actually more cosmopolitan, more outward-looking, more forward-looking, and I think it's true that uh, you know we are uh, more globalized, which is not to say we are more. a uh, cosmopolitan or we are we like to think that the world is a village but are we adopting the concerns and the dilemmas and the the problems of the village no we still want to clutch our own hurts our own sorrows our own sense of being hurt our hurt sensibilities how mindful are we of the rest of the village we which we claim as a ours you know we love to use expressions like it takes a village to raise a baby or the world is our village but what is happening in that village if somebody has been hurt by in that village are you today willing to make common cause are you today willing to be like sahir and speak up for the murderer of patris lumumba you are not because you're saying mere paas apni badi problems hain so the 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 dichotomy and uh, the irony i see here is that we are consumed by our own worries by our own anxieties by our own hurt sensibilities and we are not willing to extend that hand of friendship of solidarity of sympathy with others who have been hurt or are marginalized or pushed in other ways and why the world how many of us found solidarity with the farmers strike you know for us in delhi it was a big thing i don't know if it affected you to the same extent in bombay i know there were uh, there were marches and so on but for us in delhi we had the farmers camping at our doorstep for a year over a year till those draconian laws were eventually repealed so those farm laws were affecting many of us not all of us those of our, of, of us who were affected by it were consumed by the anxiety that these are the people who bring food to our table when they are affected how many of us are extending a hand of friendship and solidarity or saying we are with you some not all a great many of us were blithe with this regard 
you know we bought the larger narrative that was peddled to us that they are somehow dangerous people who will come and upset our pretty comfortable lives so there were very many of us who thought that it, they were some sort of threat to civilized society so i think these larger narratives that are peddled need to be examined there was a time when the poet was the public intellectual not always now yeah we have an sol gulzar we have a javed akhtar who raises his voice about the pandemic about the farmers rights and talks and rights poetry about them but by and large it worries me that there is a blithe disregard even amongst our literary community we will write a novel that will become a best seller about um, you know people work in in a company that becomes a, a you know a, it's turned into a three idiots or a chetan bhagat novel is filmized and its rights are sold for crores of rupees but uh, certain issues are still considered you know no man's land um i'd be very happy to see a film made or a ott platform picking up a uh, farmer's uh, struggles or other things we choose battles certain issues are fashionable they are picked up so you have a gangs of wasipur or you have a story about um, you know the smaller towns that are now becoming uh, you know a dahar or a kathal which is picked up by ott platforms so you have a slice of small town in india being served on an ott platform but we are still choosing them we are choosing things that are picturesque that are uh, make nice stories you've lamented that one no longer sees great fiction in urdu tell me about the trajectory of urdu literature through the decades is it kind of related or simultaneous with the sort of the dissipation of the whole progressive writers movement is it because there was a sense in independence that oh you know the, the big battle has been won and now we can sort of chill and take it easy uh, and also tell me about sort of the ecosystem around literature in each of these languages because to some extent the arts would also depend on what is happening in society if you know one there is the, the whole politics again to do to i am guessing more and more english has become the big language which everybody wants to learn for instrumental reasons uh, the a lot of the publishing industry may then um, uh, you know privilege that so give me a sense of the ecosystem around literature the publishing the writers the artists uh, give me a sense of how that has played out through the decades first uh, let me just correct uh, my statement which you have interpreted uh, to mean that i have said that no great fiction is being written i'm not saying that in urdu i'm saying no great novel has been written in recent times we've my had bad, my bad i think i must have read it in an article actually yeah, i wasn't picking yeah. up from what so, you said so uh, i will not say that no great fiction is being written in urdu yes it's true that we've not had a major defining definitive epic iconic novel such as for example uh, aag ka darya ba qurat ul ain hadar in recent times uh, and it's very bewildering for me and i have many many theories about it but no real answer a lot of fiction as in short stories is happening and a fair amount of it is happening in different parts of the country wherever urdu is uh, flourishing uh, in aurangabad in hyderabad in uh, different parts of maharashtra where urdu is very rehman abbas from bombay is doing amazing creative writing he's in fact written a couple of novels uh, so i won't say there is nothing Reh- rehman abbas from bombay has written some very uh, good uh, novels also other writing happening uh, such as zakia mashadi from patna sm ashraf who's a retired income tax commissioner so there is writing happening in gujarat in uh, in uh, different parts of uttar pradesh the uh, i won't say there is no fiction at all uh, it's of a different kind um, we can't stick to one yardstick and say everything has to match up to a manto to a kuratul ain hadar to an ismat chuktai the literary canon changes with time and the yardsticks of fiction change styles of fiction change so i've just brought out a collection of uh, urdu short stories best modern urdu short stories is just came out in uh, in december 23 uh, published by hapa collins it's called urdu best modern stories the concerns are changing the ways of writing is changing which is not to say good writing is not happening i am not saying that at all i will also not say that literature is being written in isolation of society no that is not so the stories are picked up for this uh, collection 
reflect society in some way or the other not all because not all writing must be socially engaged um if we were to go back to the reasons why the progressive writers movement i did not decline or peter out or die but it kind of lessened and diminished in importance uh from its high noon in the 40s was Uh, in a purely literary sense the rise of another movement which was happening as this movement was going up the other movement which is called modernism was also gaining ascendancy and this modernism you might think modernism and progressivism are the same things but no they occupy two ends of the literary spectrum modernism was in urdu it's called jadidiyat it was saying that it's okay for a writer to talk of his hurts his concerns his anxieties his dilemmas his disconnect from society and what he writes what he says may or may not make sense to you but it's perfectly legitimate and okay for a writer to talk of of that his sense of angst his dislocation so and he can evolve as obtuse as obscure a set of images and metaphors as he wants and he need not write socially purposive socially engaged socially uh, socially involved writing he can talk of himself he need not write of society so jadidiyat and progressivism were at loggerheads and in the 50s and by the 60s we begin to see that progressives are occupying one end of the literary spectrum and the modernists the jadid parast are occupying the other end of the spectrum and they are saying main to sirf apne dukh ki baat karunga aur main uske liye metaphors or symbols evolve karunga ijad karunga coin karunga which makes sense to me gaddar amrudon ki khushboo pagal kar jaye meri in sukhi aankhon ko jal thal kar jaye this is shehryar who was both jadid who is both progressive let me quote from memory a very small poem by shehryar which i see as an example of how you can be both jadid parast and progressive in some cases and be so successfully he says ye jo aasmaan pe sitara hai ise apni aankh se dekh lo ise apne haath se chhu lo ise apne hoont se चूम लो कि इसी पे हमला है रात का हुँ? अब रात क्या है इट कुड बी एनी थिंग इट कुड बी जस्ट अ रेगुलर नाइट और इट कुड बी अ स्वॉमिंग ऑफ डार्क फोर्सेस कमिंग टुगेदर ऑफ सम फोर्सेस व्हिच आर इनिमिकल टू टू यू टू सोसाइटी व्हाट इज सितारा इट इज एन एम्ब्लम ऑफ होप व्हाट इज सीइंग विद योर आंख होल्डिंग विद योर टचिंग विद योर हैंड हाथ से चूम देख लो आंख से चूम what is all this this is it could be an activist suggestion that touch it hold it see it so it is real now what is happening in a purely literary sense is that the jadid are saying i am going to evolve my own vocabulary here in the case of shehryar raat aank chand sitara hoot ye sab metaphors hain there is no mention of any one dark force but to me it seems clear that the subtext is that you know there is something happening there is something on the horizon and it's up to you whether you want to touch it and feel it and make it real or you don't so the jadid parast are saying that i will talk of my hurts my sorrows my anxieties in my own way the progressives are saying no you cannot afford to be oblique and obscure call a spade a spade talk about the dark forces name them in the process what you were earlier alluding to there is the charge of propaganda there is a charge of sloganeering against the progressives one charge and in some cases justifiably that is made against the progressives was that they were becoming very strident in their propaganda in their sloganeering and in the process maybe literature took a hit maybe good poetry took a hit because what was being churned out not by all but by some progressives was in the nature of sloganeering and it was not good literature it was not good poetry and so 
they allowed ideology to override the demands of literature so it's a fine balance that the poet and the writer actually have to make between ideology and literature some are able to do it very successfully like the sheer you and i quoted from sahir uh, written for patris lumumba it was written for patris lumumba but it is still quoted zulm aakhir zulm hai badhta hai to mit jata hai khoon phir khoon hai tapkega to jam jayega and i actually feel even though you mentioned the importance of context while talking about it that out of any context it is also incredibly it powerful along, it's that but that is the test of good literature it rises above its time and circumstance and speaks and continues to speak when faiz is saying bol ke lab azad hain tere bol zuban ab tak teri hai this was written during a time of great uh, oppression in pakistan but it is not a about pakistan it in delhi when teachers sit on a strike against the vice chancellor in delhi university they say bol zaba ab tak teri hai bol you know so or when the workers in a in a factory uh, in in, uh, in 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 the outskirts of delhi sit on a strike against the uh, against the management and sing bol they are not talking about the pakistan of faiz they are talking about the haryana and gurgaon of their times and what their management in gurgaon are doing against them and that is the test of good poetry that it is not confined to its time and space that it will continue to speak to you years later even when the context has changed why because tyranny is tyranny injustice is injustice you know it can take different garbs it, it can speak in different voices but if something is unjust it continues to be unjust if the rich have more power than the weak uh, and the poor then that injustice that inequality remains so 50 years later it will remain so and i'm reminded of uh, the resurrection of phases hum dekhenge hum dekhenge in recent times lazim hai ki hum bhi dekhenge yes 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 it was written जब बुत उठवाए जाएंगे सो इट सीम्स टू बी अबाउट जब इस काबे से सब बुत उठवाए जाएंगे देर आर सम पीपल इन इंडिया हु क्रिएटेड अ कंट्रोवर्सी वेर नन वॉज देर एंड दिस सेट दिस इज अ वेरी इस्लामिक पोएम एंड इट शुड बी बैंड द रेफरेंस टू द बुत एंड द काबा इज बिकॉज he wrote it when he was imprisoned and he thought all this references to the but and the kaaba will pass through the censors who are reading his poetry and they'll think are ye to koi religious poem hai but the but and the kaaba and the all of those ref- seemingly islamic references are actually to injustice to a to the paving of the way of a more just society so i think these are red herrings that people get swayed by and they refuse to see the context again we go back to the the context that is often more important than a text and so this poem is a wonderful example of that once upon a time if you were sort of a creative person you love storytelling and urdu was your first language it would be natural for you to want to be a writer in urdu and all your incentives are driving you there Today we live in a time where, like, first of all, many of us then as now are multilingual. But you also live in a time where a storyteller doesn't just have one medium to tell a story, and even within a medium, there isn't just one form to tell a story. You know, you can uh, today you can, you know, what blogging made possible was you can write eighty words, you can write eight thousand words, you can write eighty thousand words. You don't have to do an eight hundred no word article. No filter, no gatekeepers. You don't have to be with the news cycle. You can write exactly what you want, and so there is that freedom there today. Young creators are jumping into YouTube, TikTok. TikTok unfortunately got banned, which I thought was a tremendous tragedy because there was such an outpouring of. uh creativity happening there uh, across our towns and villages but again without filter again without filter and it, it will just beautiful and by the way you spoke of whatsapp university earlier let me tell you that uh, so i teach a r- online writing course and when tic- when i discovered tiktok i was so happy with it i thought ki mujhe i put together a course called tiktok in indian society to sort of share some theories on what it revealed about how we were changing and the only possible way to teach that course was on whatsapp because i would have to share hundreds of vertical videos or zoom pe call pe nahi ho sakta kisi cheez pe nahi ho sakta so that was actually literally what up university but to get away from the digression to my question 
टूडे अ क्रिएटिव पर्सन हैज मैनी मैनी एवेन्यूज आप रील बना सकते हो आप यू नो यू कैन मेक अ शॉर्ट फिल्म ऑन यूट्यूब यू कैन राइट अ ब्लॉग यू कैन राइट अ न्यूज़ लेटर यू कैन डू एवरी थिंग द होल इको सिस्टम फॉर अ क्रिएटिव पर्सन इज चेंज इफ यू वॉन्ट टू प्रोटेस्ट ऑल्सो यू हैव मोर न्यू क्रिएटिव वेज ऑफ प्रोटेस्टिंग विच आई थिंक ऑल्सो अफेक्ट द स्ट्रक्चर ऑफ मूवमेंट्स बिकॉज टूडे एनी वन कैन एंटर अ मूवमेंट एट लो कॉस्ट जस्ट बाई ट्वीटिंग एंड 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 दैट लीड्स टू अ लॉट ऑफ परफॉर्मेटिव बिहेवियर बट दैट्स अ डिफरेंट मैटर सो गिव मी अ सेंस ऑफ यू नो that landscape of what you know how urdu literature has changed that has it been adversely affected by this like was urdu, what was urdu publishing like uh, in say 1930 in 1950 in 1970 what is it like now is that a possible reason that people have stopped writing uh, great novels in urdu for example though as you pointed out and everyone should obviously pick up your uh, new collection as you pointed out there is a lot of work happening but give me a sense of those incentives and uh, you know because it seems to me that if i'm a young writer in urdu today i have like hazar options unlike say 1930 where a book is considered at the pinnacle of everything and you know so on and so forth no let me address two things here first the literary ecosystem itself um then i'll come to the urdu sure. one uh, separately because i see them as distinct mm-hmm. writing in english offers you that many more options uh, writing in urdu offers you that many fewer options why because of the medium but we'll come to that in a bit i go to universities and colleges and speak to young people where there's a hunger to be to write and to be published everybody is in a hurry to write of course my first piece of uh, very ageist advice is read 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 and then start writing that is seen with some skepticism because everybody wants to be published to that i say that uh when i was young and uh, we uh, you know in my generation uh if you wanted to be a writer the one option that was easily and freely available to you was writing your own diary because that was one thing you could do because you were not dependent on anybody that is where you wrote your uh, innermost thoughts where you learn to formulate ideas and put them into words and so on otherwise there weren't that many options there was a school magazine or a college magazine but that also passed through the school editor this and that young people today are blessed in that they have any number of options nobody can stop you as you say a lot of it is perf- performative you put out a post on facebook on twitter or hundreds of options that you have snapchat this that whatever uh it suffers from a, a built in inadequacy which is the lack of a filter which is both good and bad it is unbridled freedom of expression you put it out there you let it hang out there in public which is all very good but in the process there is no quality control here we are not even talking of political correctness rightness or wrong or, or about something being outright offensive we are not even going there we are talking of the nuts and bolts of writing there is nobody to tell you so i read very badly uh formulated badly written grammatically incorrect gross sounding ideas put out there that is one thing so a uh, print medium a uh, formal print medium had these uh, uh checks and balances there was an editor who f- looked at your writing who fixed your writing who, 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 who at least if nothing else took care of the grammatical major bloomers now there's no one to do that so there is that you know this comes with pros and cons we are still talking of english writing i'll come to urdu writing in a bit here uh, when you put it out there the lack of filter works for well it's freedom of expression you, the votaries of freedom of expression say the idea is to put it out there rather than be worried about niceties i'm not entirely sure what good it does uh, i i am old fashioned to the extent that i believe that what you need to be to say needs to be said in as felicitous a manner as possible uh, for it to be effective communication communication is not just a barrage of words communication to be effective has to serve certain purposes it therefore must have certain criteria those criteria are accessibility what i'm saying cannot be gibberish for it to be communication i need to be coherent i need to be comprehensible often a great deal of this blog writing or tweets or posts or whatever they come under the broad category of gibberish why because nobody has thought it through why because nobody has a uh, thought of you know 
putting some time and effort in what it's it's verbal diarrhea what we don't need is verbal diarrhea what we need is something with some amount of nuance so either the checks and balances have to come from you yourself or uh then don't pass it off as serious writing then just see it as i'm letting it all hang out there if you have uh, uh ambitions of being a writer you will need some rigor you will need somebody urdu mein kehte hain isla bade se bada shayar apni isla karata tha log ghalib ke paas jate the ye kehne ke liye ki hamari isla kar dijiye which means whatever poetry and in 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 poetry in urdu there's always been a tradition of mentoring of ustad hona to the ustad's job was to tinker to tweak to take away some uh, flab to remove excess to suggest brutally or kindly depending on your temperament what is wrong with this of just maybe adding a word here or there you know so isla ki apni khubiyan thi you learned from the master from the ustad ये तो हुई जनरल बात अबाउट कम्युनिकेशन दैट वी ऑल नीड सम इसला वी एटलीस्ट इन आर फॉर्मेटिव ईयर्स यंग पीपल वेन दे स्टार्टिंग आउट इफ दे आर जस्ट पुटिंग इट आउट देर अलग बात है बट इफ दे हैव सम एम्बिशन ऑफ बिकमिंग प्रोफेशनल राइटर्स और सीरियस राइटर्स दे विल नीड मैंटरिंग दे विल नीड समबडी टू रीड वट दे हैव रिटन एंड टू टेल दैम कि इसमें ये गलत है ये ठीक है ये तो जनरल बात हुई वी कम नाउ टू उर्दू I don't see the same sort of writing happening in Urdu on social media. Yes, uh, on my feed I get a lot of posts where I'm marked or flagged or uh, about writing in Urdu. Even iPhones now have Urdu script so you can actually write a, a tweet in Urdu using the Urdu font and put it out there in Urdu. Likh to maine diya lekin kitne log use padhenge? Hm? So increasingly now even if i'm writing a share and i want to share it uh i will not use unfortunately while i can read and write in urdu i will write it in roman why because i want social media means i want to have a reach i'm not preaching to the converted i'm not just writing to those who already know and understand what it means i want somebody who doesn't read urdu to also read and benefit from the import of these words that i'm putting out there so that two line share instead of writing in urdu i will use uh, roman this is what i do you asked uh, your question was specifically about urdu writing it's neither dead nor dying it is happening it's happening in pockets what is remarkable and very interesting is that we have very few full time urdu writers there was a krishan chandar amongst us who was a full time writer he did not have a day job uh while well, he did something else and he wrote he just wrote he wrote in urdu he earned his living from writing in urdu Uh, over the years fewer and fewer uh, instances of people who are whole time writers uh, in urdu we all have uh, writers who do something i mean there was a quratul ain haider who was a full time writer there was an ismat chuktai who earned a living from writing be it for films scripts or novels or short stories that generation is now almost gone i can think of very few people who earn a living frugal and uh spartan though it might be only from writing almost all have some sort of day job or some sort of other source of income and then they also write and this is also maybe one of the reasons of the many reasons one of the reasons why we don't have major big novels why because novels require time and 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 a certain amount of effort so uh rehman abbas is of course an exception who is writing novels and good novels there are some others also uh, it's not that urdu novel writing has become extinct but we see more short stories we see more poetry being written in urdu because short stories take less time to write poetry takes less time to write and these are all people who have day jobs somebody is a you know a police officer who dabbles in poetry somebody works in the railways and does this somebody is a university teacher and does this so that is the profile of the urdu writer i think the profile of the writer has changed you know 
they all have some sort of jobs and they also happen to be writing in Urdu, be it poetry or prose. That is the one very significant change I see. But I will not say that it is dying or is dead or it has... It is flourishing in pockets. That is the best way to put it. And has it been a recent revival because of Rikta and so on? Of I course, see. of course, there is a revival of an interest in Urdu per se. I don't see it as immediately reflecting in modern contemporary writing in Urdu. I don't link the existence of festivals, lit fests and the greater prominence being given to Urdu in lit fests. I'm going to Kala Ghoda in uh, Bombay where my two sessions are both uh, circling around Urdu in one form or the other. Um, so it is not as though uh, the festival per se encourages the writing of Urdu. No, but festivals, literary festivals are making the space for uh, work in Urdu. So uh, don't think that the festival is encouraging writing per se. It's not that uh, they have sponsored me to write in Urdu. No, nobody sponsored anybody to write in Urdu as far as I know. Whatever writing is happening is happening on people's own initiative. But certainly the space being given by Litfest, whether it is a JLF having a book launch of an Urdu book, the instance of two major awards, literary awards given to works of translation from Urdu recently means Khalid Javed's book uh, which was written in Urdu which was translated into English got a major award uh, the JCB prize so all of these awards many of them which come with handsome cash awards being given to works of translation A that in itself is remarkable and not works written originally in English B uh, works from Urdu all of this is very very heartening because we see this as an interest of an interest in Urdu a revival of an interest in Urdu. Urdu is not, this revival of interest is not linked to generation of jobs for those who know Urdu. That I'm not able to see. I don't see suddenly the government opening up jobs for those who know Urdu, uh, be it as broadcasters or be it as university teachers or whatever. I'm not able to see that. But I am definitely able to see a very pronounced interest in Urdu per se, be it in the singing, be it in the Dastan Goi, be it in more ghazal programs, be it even in panel discussions, be it in anthologies such as mine. You know, 30 years ago in 1992, when I first published with uh, the Prem Chand stories that I alluded to, uh, it was a flash in the pan. Now, the same Harper Collins that 30 years ago did my Prem Chand stories it has done this new book of mine again. And in this interim, in these 30 years, I see that much more interest in Bhasha literatures. And speaking of Urdu in particular, book review editors. It's a cumulative thing. Don't think it's just any one thing. Everything comes together and adds to that interest. A book review editor in a newspaper or a magazine will make the space for a book review about a book in Urdu or about Urdu or translated from Urdu. That is one. So uh, when you read a book review in a Hindu newspaper or a, in a India Today or Outlook, uh, you, you're traveling by plane and you come across an Outlook in the plane. You read that and you say, oh, there's a new book about Urdu that's out. It, it fans an interest, right? So book reviews are one thing. They don't directly impinge on sales. It's not like a book review means 2,000 copies sold. No, it's cumulative. Uh, Litfest organizers, if they have a session for you or if they have a book launch for your new book, which is about Urdu, and they agree to launch that book at a JLF, you get a sudden fillip. So Litfests, all of these Litfests, and if it happens in way out places, like I went to the Kalinga Lit Fest in Urisa in Bhubaneswar. Now, if in Bhubaneswar we are talking about Urdu, I think it's it's great. If uh, in Kochi or Kerala or Coimbatore or Madras, we are talking, we are having a Dastan Goi performance, I think it's fabulous. If 50% of the words you don't understand, but you understand 50%, and you are soaking in the ambience of that Dastan Goi, I think it's it's great. It's opening a window. Everything leads to a larger good. I'm all for it. 
इट्स ट्रू दैट दे आर नॉट एबल टू अंडरस्टैंड एवरी वर्ड ऑफ दैट दास्तान गोई और एवरी वर्ड ऑफ दैट गज़ल कॉन्सर्ट बट दैट्स ओके इफ द इम्पोर्ट इज रीचिंग यू इफ द इफ इट इज क्रिएटिंग अ माहौल इफ इट इज क्रिएटिंग अ सर्टन फिजा in which you can partake of the sense the largest sense of what that singer is singing or what the dastan go is reciting good and why am i working via english because i'm perfectly fluent in urdu but you and i are having this conversation where i occasionally lapse into urdu but by and large this conversation is in english even though i'm talking about urdu so people like me are also uh, using english as a bridge if i go to a punjab or a small town in uttar pradesh where i think my audience will understand me better if i speak in hindustani then i will seamlessly switch into hindustani and start saying the same thing that i'm saying to your listeners right now in english i will start saying this in in, the, in hindustani because i will feel that maybe they can get a better sense of what i'm saying if i'm speaking in a language they understand and maybe they don't understand me entirely in english but when i go south of the vindhyas maybe i'll speak entirely in english and use fewer hindi words or urdu words or fewer direct uh, quotes from urdu poetry because i feel my audience will understand what i'm saying and i always uh, uh, enjoy going uh, to south to the southern states and speaking about urdu because again i feel that one is opening a window here for someone who understands the power of language rakshinda ji you've made a an egregious error just now a short while back where you said i lapse in urdu you do not lapse in urdu you soar in urdu oh, thank you it's uh, you know it's so enjoyable for me and i'm sure for all of my listeners I, i'm going to add a little layer to something you said and then we'll kind of move on to our final three questions and and the layer is that I agree with you that there is a danger in people just putting whatever they feel like putting out there and etc etc there's a lot of rubbish out there but there's this phrase called sturgeon's law and sturgeon's law says that 95% of everything is crap and it is just that we are we have more of that 95% in our face today but you know it, that that is just the way it is however i actually encourage my writing students to write as much as they can because you learn by doing you know if if you write clearly you begin to think clearly writing aids in your thinking so i think it's it's like going to a writing gym so i feel that yeah the vast majority of stuff will still be crap but there will be a few who by constant iteration by going out there by writing again and again will just automatically becoming become better like the way i think about it is and these are off hand numbers i'm throwing but assume in the past out of every 1000 people five would become writers today i think out of every 1000 people 15 can become writers if a hundred of them start blogs so obviously we'll still have a majority of crap but i think the only way to sort of uh, uh, you know become better is to do something again and again and again so uh, in that regard i yeah but not at the risk of dumbing down not at the risk of encouraging me- mediocrity a everybody doesn't have to be a writer yes you need to be coherent you need to be you know you need to be comprehensible you need to be accessible what you're saying and writing needs to be understood because that is the basic rule of communication uh, and needs to be said in as philosophical it is a manner as possible all of that is fine so we are not uh, encouraging the vast population to become writers that is not our job who will be a reader then there need to be readers as well just as there, there are writers there is that the other thing i feel is that my worry here is that if everything gets published and there's a lot of vanity publishing happening even mainstream publishing houses have a dedicated wing for vanity publishing they may call it by any fancy name but essentially it is vanity publishing which is i pay you money and you publish my book in the process we have done away with a filter a very important filter which is that uh, what appears in book form should be something which would should have some merit some value something that somebody gains from so many times we are seeing things that have no business being out there on our shelves again you can well you can play devil's advocate and say who decides who decides the merit of a thing you know uh, is there a weighing scale is there a is there an instrument a tool whereby you do that but uh as uh, as 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 you do writing workshops i often speak to young people i think i i'm not going to encourage encourage writing even 
as you say that it you know you will fall and then you will rise and then you will correct yourself there is that in the best case scenario but more often than not what happens is that we are encouraging mediocrity we are encouraging banality and i think those are major sins in writing at least you know the way i think about it is that i am not encouraging everyone to write i am just saying i won't discourage anyone from writing and everything finds its own level so like you correctly said those values of accessibility of being vivid in your prose helping people relate to that if you don't have those values you won't get any readers and you'll either you'll stop writing or you will inculcate those values to get more readers uh, which is also uh, good for me but i just feel that uh, and as far as filters are concerned i think the great a great modern situation we find ourselves in across fields is that the mainstream has crumbled and the filters of the past are irrelevant anyway like a couple of years back i was part of the jcb literature prize jury with sara rai and others and and we lamented the quality of the books that came to us because there was so much rubbish that we had difficulty putting a long list together i mean it, it, it was just unspeakably bad but then the point is that you know i've had some 2400 writing students so far in the last 3 years many of them have started newsletters many of them a couple of them have written books as well and i just feel that you know may a thousand flowers bloom you want so i'm not going to go to a non writer and say hey block shuru karo you know that's rubbish and i realize that a lot of the people who want to write some of them will turn out to be mediocre but i still encourage everyone to start and this is you know especially true it's women who need this encouragement the most because so many women are filled with this imposter syndrome and they will convince themselves that they can't do it before they even try so i would rather err on the side of getting too much writing out there than sort of getting uh, too little i've taken a lot of your time today uh, three final questions to sort of end with and one is that there's a quote i love and i ask all my uh, guests about it these days it's almost become a cliche any dillard once said the way we live our days is the way we live our lives and that has sort of really stayed with me because when we are young we think of our life in grandiose terms ye karenge wo karenge etc etc and i think as one gets older one realizes that no ultimately our life boils down to just a collection of all our days so you want to think about how do i want to spend my time what are the things that matter to me what is the stuff that i want to be intentional about etc etc so tell me about your typical day and your ideal day okay my typical day is um, a day where i have uh, done some good writing and so is my ideal day the same uh, a typical day uh, would uh, i get up very late in the day i'm not an early riser and if there's one thing i could change about myself i would love to be one of those people who are up bright and early and go for morning walks i'm afraid i don't do that i am lazy uh, yeah and so um, i would love to be more energetic and more athletic and more sort of outdoorsy which I'm, unfortunately i'm not an ideal day uh, i think would be one uh, with some good food some good company a para or two or even a line of good writing either my own or somebody else's that stays with me and yes uh, going to sleep with the thought that my loved ones are okay beautiful my penultimate question is If I ask you to look ahead if I ask you to look at where this country is and where it is going and we've spoken a bit about that in the course of this conversation at well uh, as well what gives you hope and what gives you despair We talked of them actually all through this conversation there is a lot of despair there's a lot of frustration uh, helplessness sometimes flashes of anger um sometimes rage also uh because i feel so invested in uh, in the world i live in in the country i live in the country that is my home i am so invested in it that i feel uh, uh anger and helplessness and all of that we talked of that and uh, i i did talk of the one big fly in the ointment that i see which is the bigger tree that i am now increasingly seeing uh, growing uh, around me communalism that i see growing around me uh so those are things that fill me with a lot of um, despair but every now and then there will be a voice of sanity uh, every now and then there will be somebody ex- uh, often strangers often people that you don't know in fact more often than not there will be strangers when this uh, bully by thing happened to me last year i got 
emails and messages i don't know how they found my emails i don't know how they found my uh, 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 phone numbers i got text messages from completely random people and it is these that fill you with uh, hope you know there is goodness uh, in this world it would be a very dark day when one has to say that the goodness has leached out of our lives i don't think the human condition is such that all goodness all decency all grace all you know the ability to show grace under pressure will go out of our lives no i don't think it will i don't think the despair can fully overwhelm uh, me ever totally well said it's like you know to paraphrase from the earlier poem kiss the star to keep the darkness away yes. and not before the darkness comes my final question and a much happier question uh, i'm glad to say uh, it's a custom of all the guests who come on my show right at the end to recommend for me and my listeners books films music that mean a lot to them and there's it makes them so happy they want to share it with the world you're even welcome to read out um, you know anything that you want to read out that comes to mind but just art that makes you happy you know this is a question ideally that uh, needs a little bit of reflection and i'm not carrying any material with me that i could read from but off the top of my head and this would be a very strange example uh, to give for somebody who's been talking about urdu for the past couple of hours but the one book i recommend the one that i like that i pick up and read the film too that i pick up and read is jane austen's pride and prejudice just the other day i was watching for the nth time i don't know which version of pride and prejudice on netflix and there are many many versions of the film made um the novel continues to give me delight uh, i love that woman elizabeth bennet um, you know she's feisty she's fun um so i like jane austen i like many of her uh, novels i read them uh, when i was very young um in school i think then i read them again as an undergrad uh, doing english honors we had mansfield park in our course um uh and then i read them again and then i as a mother i gave a copy of pride and prejudice to my daughter to read i'm happy that both my daughters love uh, jane austen almost as much as i do so i i realize it's a bit unorthodox choice of a favorite novel or a favorite writer to be handing out to your listeners after having talked about urdu literature not at all literature the is past literature many hours now But yeah from the top of my head she's one author that immediately comes to mind because of her ability to what she called to write on that little inch of ivory um and the fact what we've been talking about actually uh, that literature good literature rises above its time and circumstance and speaks uh, to you so she is not talking about the village or the city in england alone or that society but she is talking about the human condition and she's talking about human frailties she's talking about human strengths uh that are not confined to that time in england alone i think it talks of society of people that is why they were called uh, novels of manners uh, when it, when we talk of urdu poetry i enjoy uh, dipping into the diwan of uh, mirza ghalib uh, for ghalib it is said that he has written something for every moment of uh, uh, a human's life in one of his own share he says goya ye bhi mere dil mein hai that this too lies in my heart and i think he sensed that the poet's job is to really interpret the human heart so i always have a diwan e ghalib handy somewhere and i love to read things that i know by heart but to just see it written on a page brings enormous pleasure The other thing I I like to have handy uh usually somewhere near me is um uh, Faiz Ahmed Faiz. Uh I lived for a year abroad and in that one year I'd taken along a selected works of Faiz and that was like my bible I would take it out in that distant cold country. Um when I was miserable and homesick I would just read a lot of Faiz to myself. That always gives me great pleasure. any favorites you remember oh many many we we quoted today uh, uh, another that i like very much is mujhse pehli se mohabbat mere mehboob na mang i love that there is a two collection volume of poetry called hindustan hamara it was edited by and put together by um, janisar akhtar 
a fine Urdu poet, a progressive poet, today regrettably known only by a few as the poet Javed Akhtar's father, but that is not his claim to fame. He was a fine poet in his own right. And this collection, uh, this anthology that he's edited is beautiful. I use it all the time for the columns, for the writings, the different kinds of writings I do. Hindustan Hamara has been very intelligently put together uh, with a fine uh, way of drawing up the list of contents subject-wise. So let's say you're looking on, it's about India, as the title suggests, Urdu poetry on different aspects of India. So there's politics, there's society, there is um, a, a whole bunch of things like Hamare Mausam, so there'll be poetry on Dilli ke jade or uh, Gulabi jade or Barsat ki khushiyan or Garmi ke maze. So there'll be poetry on the seasons. There'll be poetry on, sec on, on cities, Bhopal, Agra, Aligarh, Bombay, you know, different poetry, Bengal ka jadu, that kind of thing. There'll be poetry on political milestones, the first, uh, uh, Gandhi's first non-cooperation movement, Gandhi's second non-cooperation movement, uh, 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 independence, partition, the first 25 years of independence, you know. So there'll be uh, political events, there'll be social events, there'll be poetry on culture, Hamari uh, Rehnuma, you know, our religious leaders, our uh, political leaders. So there'll be poetry on Gandhi, Nehru, this, that. There'll be poetry on our religious figures, on Mahavir, on Buddha, on Nanak, on Ram, on Krishna. So much poetry has been written. Taken together, what this two volume tells me time and time again and why I mine it time and time and again. And there is this collection of essays that I'm currently writing for Simon and Schuster. It's called In the Mirror of Urdu. I keep using this book and other such sources to make one large point, which I express in different ways, which is about the Catholicity of Urdu poetry, which is about not one or two or three, but multiple strands that run through Urdu literature and more specifically Urdu poetry uh, that the Urdu poet not just now not just the contemporary poet but for centuries for hundreds of years has been concerned about many things and it is so wrong it is so erroneous and completely um, distorted view to see Urdu as a the language of Muslims or Urdu poetry to be just romantic poetry. I have nothing against romantic poetry. I love romantic poetry. But Urdu is not, Urdu poetry is not just the poetry about love and romance and loss and longing. It has a whim and vigor. It has political muscle. It talks of a myriad concerns and it does so in different voices in different ways so um, Janisar Akhtar's Hindustan Hamara is also available in Devnagri script uh, I would urge people to keep a copy handy at home Marvelous uh, thank you so much for spending so much time today it's, it's just been a privilege and I'm sure I'll learn a lot when I hear this episode again thank you very much for having me on this if you enjoyed listening to this episode, please share it with anyone who you think might be interested. Head on over to your nearest bookstore online or offline and ideally offline because that's what Rakshinda would prefer and pick up well, all her books. I just love all her work. They're all linked from the show notes. Uh, so go for it. You can follow Rakshinda on Twitter at Rakshinda Jalil. That's one word. You can follow me on Twitter at Amit Verma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. -A you can browse past episodes of The Scene and the Unseen at sceneunseen.in. Thank you for listening. Did you enjoy this episode of The Seen and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to seenunseen.in slash support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.